Hi, thank you for joining us today. Spot Uranium is up over 40% on the year, making it one of the best performing commodities globally. So we thought it would be a good time to put together a Uranium conference focused on industry experts, producers, developers, and also explore coasts. Canada is the second largest producer of Uranium in the world. And it also produces some of the highest grades found anywhere in the world. And it's all found in the province of Saskatchewan in a region known as the Athabasca Basin. And you're going to be hearing a lot about the basin from our various presenters throughout these presentations today. So let's go through the presenters. The conference begins with our first industry expert, Elisa Kokorin of Kopernik Global Investors. Kopernik is an asset manager based in Tampa, Florida, and manages over $6 billion in assets, a portion of which is allocated toward uranium stocks. Elisa is going to take us through why they are bullish on this sector, where they see the uranium price going, and also how they value uranium stocks. Our first company presenter is David Cates of Denison Mines. Denison is an advanced developer focused on the eastern portion of the Athabasca Basin with its flagship property, Wheeler River, which is comprised of two projects which are moving through the feasibility process and together have 109 million pounds of uranium. Denison also has a portfolio of exploration projects as well as a partial interest in the McLean Lake Mill. Up next is Ross McElroy of Fission Uranium. Vision is a developer focused on the southwestern portion of the Athabasca Basin. Vision's flagship asset is the Triple R deposit, which has a pre-feasibility completed, and Vision is currently pursuing a feasibility study, which will be completed later in 2022. The Triple R deposit has 102 million pounds of uranium in the indicated category. Then we will hear from Tim Gebrick, CEO of ISO Energy. ISO Energy is focused on the eastern portion of the Athabasca Basin and is one of the most active exploration companies in the, in the basin and is currently undergoing an aggressive drilling campaign with two rigs focused on its hurricane deposit. ISO Energy has a total of 24 projects and Tim will highlight which ones he and his team are focusing on. Up next is Lee Courier, CEO of NextGen Energy. NextGen is an advanced developer focused on the southwestern area of the basin. NextGen has 209 million pounds of uranium and completed a feasibility study on the RIF-1 project earlier this year, and we will review the results of that feasibility study with Lee. NextGen also owns a large portfolio of exploration properties through its 51% interest in ISO Energy. Then we will hear from John Champaglia, CEO of Sprott Asset Management. John and his team oversee the management of the Sprott Uranium Physical Trust product, and John is going to provide a first-hand look at how the product works and where he sees the uranium price going. Then we will hear from Askar Badrbaev, the Chief Commercial Officer of Kazataprom. Kazataprom is based in Kazakhstan and is the world's largest uranium producer. Askar is going to provide us with an overview of Kazataprom's operations, its production profile, and where they see the uranium price going. If you have any questions for any of our presenters, feel free to send us an email to info at blurstreetcapital.com or you can write your question in the open chat on the right hand side of the screen. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, Blur Street Capital, and also hit the notification button so you'll be kept up to date on future events. I hope you enjoy the conference. Hi, Elisa, and thank you for joining us today. It's good to see you again. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. How are things in Tampa? Blue skies and sunshine? Yes, it's finally starting to cool off. So, so Florida is starting to be a, a livable place again. It's been a hot summer. Elisa, before we begin, I want to provide a quick overview on where I want to take this discussion. And first, I want to touch on Copernic and examine your investment style. And then I want to move on to uranium and find out exactly how it fits into your investment style. I also want to touch on how you value uranium equities, 
And then I just want to conclude on where you and your team think the long-term price of uranium is going. So why don't we just begin with an overview of Copernic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Copernic was founded in 2013. We are a global value investment fund. So we invest in all caps, all sectors, all countries, value being the prerequisite. We will never overpay knowingly for a business. So our job is to look across the globe and find businesses, value those businesses, and then wait for the market to be <clears throat> extremely irrational or emotional, and we can take advantage of those opportunities. So today we are finding a lot of value in emerging markets as well as, as commodities such as such as uranium. And what is your AUM? We are managing about seven billion dollars now. So we are uh, very happy with that. <laughs> that's that's another thing is that we are we are capacity constrained. Um, we do not want to be become a, a big in investment firm where these small opportunities such as uranium don't do not move the needle anymore. Um, we're also long-term investors. And then we really pride ourselves on the, the ability to take on career risk, own these uncomfortable positions to lower the investment risk for our clients. So mining stocks, production company stocks, these are extremely volatile uh, companies, which you can you can see in the in the last uh, couple of months we've we've fortunately had upside volatility in in the uranium companies, but for a very long time we had to be very patient. We've owned uranium mining companies since 2013. Um, for a long time, all they seemed to do was was go down. So um, <laughs> we're we're happy to to see that the the thesis is finally starting to be recognized in in the market, um, but. But this was a this was a painful investment for for many years and 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 many companies and many uh, firms will not be that patient. Elisa, you mentioned that you're a value investor and you go where you see value. What sectors do you see value in right now? There are uh, across a lot of sectors we see a lot of value. However. Most of that is in emerging markets, as, as you know well, that the U.S. markets are extremely expensive. Uh, it's very hard to find value in the U.S. So emerging markets make up close to 40% of our investment fund. Um, commodities, extraction businesses are also areas that people don't really want to, to touch. So 45% of our, our fund is in, invested in these sorts of production companies. Gold mining is close to 25%. Uh, uranium is 9% of our fund, and then the remainder is in natural gas and, and oil. Elisa, that's a great overview of Copernic and your investment philosophy. Now let's discuss how uranium fits into that philosophy. Why are you so bullish on uranium? So the uranium, we, we're bullish on it because we believe it's underpriced. Uranium today is around $40 a pound. We believe, and, and across all commodities, we invest after figuring out what they, they're worth from an incentive price. Now the incentive price is the price that incentivizes enough supply to, to balance future demand. So from our standpoint, based on the cost curve, based on our, our talks with management teams, the incentive price for uranium is closer to, to $70 to $90 a pound. Now that, that range is wide, but that's because the supply curve becomes very steep at the, the far right of the, of the curve. Um, so from our standpoint, uranium is still underpriced. You're not seeing new mines being built. You're not seeing acquisitions. Management teams tend to, to be very pro-cyclical. Um, and you're not seeing new supply that was cut during the bear market being brought on yet. So we still think that there's room to run with, with uranium. On the demand side, it's also very positive. Um, new gov governments are, are starting to recognize that uranium is a zero carbon, very low cost, good base load power supply. 
Um, and so the the attitude around nuclear power is is uh, improving as well. So we we see a lot of nuclear power plants being built in in emerging markets. Some of the the power plants in developing markets are which were were supposed to be shut down are now you're seeing uh, governments decide that maybe we want to extend these. The the cost of just extending the life of a nuclear power plant is much cheaper than than buying. Um, so the demand side looks good. Obviously, the, the bear case for the demand side would be if it was another Fukushima or something that that happens. But um, but at this point, those risks are are more than than priced into both the uranium price as well as the the mining companies. Alisa, you mentioned that your AUM is approximately $7 billion, 9% of that is allocated toward uranium stocks. How many uranium stocks do you, you do you own and are you focused on the large caps or will you also go down cap? As I mentioned, we, we invest in all caps. So we have a couple of production companies. We have two, a couple companies that just hold uranium as well as some explorers that are sitting on uranium deposits but haven't yet mined that yet and do you have a preference for producers over developers or developers over explore coast or for us price is paramount so we size our positions based on a the, the market cap we can't have a obviously a huge position in in the smaller company but um but we also size based on the upside that we see risk adjusted. So from our standpoint, the, the holding company is, is less risky than the producing company, which is less risky than the company that is sitting on uranium, but we haven't seen the capital being spent get there yet. And, and there's all sorts of risks that go along with that. So we value all of the pounds the same, we say, the, the holding companies, those those pounds have been out of the ground, so that's valued at our incentive price. The production companies have uranium in the ground, which the the market is giving a, a huge discount between pounds above ground and, and pounds below ground. We think that discount is too large. And then they're discounting even, even further the, the, the explorer companies. Uh, so we say all companies, a mining company at least, all those pounds are worth roughly $30 a pound, but we will heavily risk adjust the, the companies in Kazakhstan or the companies that haven't built a mine. Uh, there's so many different risks that can uh, go wrong with, with a mining company. And so we wait for the market to be extremely inefficient before we invest in a mining company. Spot uranium has gone from $30 to as high as $50 in the last few weeks. Are you still bullish given this move in the spot price? Absolutely. We obviously less bullish than we were when uranium was 20. That was just an unbelievable opportunity. Now at 40, we still see upside relative to the incentive price. Uh, you know, MacArthur still has not come online. There's there's still the the largest, highest grade mine in the world that is that is sitting idle. Uh, we think that, you know, hopefully that we'll see when when they bring that back on. That that's an indication of of getting closer to the incentive price. We still have not seen companies acquire each other, and that is something that you see in the bull bull markets. Um, there are a lot of uranium pounds that are sitting idle in Africa. Those have not been brought on. So. Once we start seeing those sorts of, of actions, then we, you know that you're getting closer to the incentive price. An example is, and, th and then oftentimes the, the commodities will overshoot. For example, in, in the early 2000s, you had uranium go from 20 to $137 a pound. Production will follow, production did follow, because that problem there, Kazakhstan brought on 10 times the production during that time. And then Fukushima happened, there's too much supply, the, the price comes down. So the, the commodity prices will tend to stay below the incentive price for too long, and then they go above the incentive price for too long. Right now, we're still below the incentive price. So we are still excited about uranium. 
You own both the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and also Yellow Cake. Tell us why. For the very reason that we just talked about, the uranium price is still below the incentive price. That is the, the long run price that, that we're using. So once we get closer to that, you will see us trim out of, out of those stocks. And in terms of the big cap producers, you own both Kazataprom and also Cameco. Given one is based in Kazakhstan and another one is based in Canada, do you value them differently? From a theoretical value standpoint, no. Every company that holds uranium gets $30 uranium. That's the, the cost, that, that's the, the amount we think they'll, they'll earn over a long term. However, we are talking about Kazakhstan and Canada, and obviously we want a much larger margin of safety before we invest in Kazakhstan than in Canada. Because that problem is cheaper than Cameco on a per pound basis, and therefore there, we do see more upside with Kazan and Prom. However, you have to heavily risk adjust for the geopolitical risk. Both of them have fantastic minds, and they both have extremely long reserve lives. Uh, management teams have done very well. So, so we like both of them. We prefer one geography over another. Have you or any members of your team done site visits to either one? Many members, uh, two members of our team have gone up to to Cameco's mines. Uh, we have not yet visited Kazakhstan. However, that sounds very interesting. We we do travel a lot to see a lot of the the mining companies that we go to. Um, my favorite trip was in was going to Mongolia to visit the Oyutolgoi mine. Uh, the copper mine. Oh wow! When was that? That was 2016, I believe. Yeah. So there's a number of uranium mines shut down due to the low price, with the largest one being Camagos MacArthur River. You already touched on that, and you've mentioned that this notion of the incentive price being where the price where people are incentivized to start producing again. So what price do you think we're going to see an influx of mines coming on and in mines starting up again? It's, it's an estimate. It's a tough price to, to be accurate about, but we think anywhere between $70 and $90 a pound. We're not going to argue one way or another. Um, and the reason it's, it's a large range is, is, as I mentioned, that supply curve is pretty much a vertical at the, the far end. So if you see more demand than you expect, then you're closer to that $90 a pound than the 70. Lisa, let's wrap it up on where you and your team see the uranium price going. You mentioned that you think the incentive price is somewhere between 70 to $90, but does it get back to its all-time high of $137 a pound? It very well could. Oftentimes, um, the the prices overshoot the incentive price, so so we could see that. However, the solution to high prices is high prices, and and you know, we will probably see a lot of production come on, and and then prices will will come down with with more supply. Um, the other the other thing that that is bullish for commodities is the fact that we've had a huge amount of money printing. Um, this reminds us a lot of the 70s, where you had governments financing deficits through printing money, and the you had a lot of inflation, and and real assets went up a huge amount. Uranium, for example, went up close to seven times in a matter of three years. So that just gives you a sense of the scale that you you might see with with inflation. Should that um, should that move its way into the, the the real assets? Real assets today versus financial assets are the cheapest we've ever seen. If you look over a hundred year period, they're cheaper than they were in the, the early 70s before they skyrocketed higher. So there's a very good chance that uranium well overshoots the 70 to 90 range. However, our uh, you know we're not going to price that into our our investment thesis. And I think the other element that's totally different this time 
and we saw back in 06 and 07 is the fact that the two largest producers in the world, Kazataprom and Chemical, have become much more prudent and disciplined in their approach in that they're, they're just not dumping pounds onto the market. They're actually shutting in supply. Yeah, Cameco shutting down MacArthur was was the right thing to do. And we have a lot of conversations with, with management teams of mining companies saying, why are you selling your resource into an oversupplied market? Um, you know, if what, what a lot of these mining companies do is they say, oh, well, look at our, our cash costs. It's less than, than the price we're making money. But we say, well, you, it took you $60 a pound to find that and you're selling it for 20 or $30 a pound. To us, that that is a money losing um, action, but but a lot of people just look at the cash costs and they don't see that. So so Cameco did the right thing. It didn't look good from a from a DCF point of view, and when you are when you're just counting cash, and and that is a big problem in the market is is investors are only looking at current cash flows. They're they're not looking at the the cash flows that would come in in 10 years and when you're dealing with an underpriced good and a scarce good dcf models don't don't really capture that value one more question before i wrap it up elisa and it has to do with sports tampa bay has some incredible sports franchises the tampa bay buccaneers won the super bowl earlier this year the tampa bay lightning won the stanley cup and two consecutive years. What's your preference, football or hockey? Oh, I am the worst person to ask that question. I I am unfortunately not a a good sports fan. So um, that's, a, that's a better question for, for somebody who, who pays attention to sports. I, I inherited some sports teams by through marriage, but that's as far as I go. <laughs> You're just focused on making money. That's right. I, I, my, all my attention is, is on uh, finding investment opportunities. Yes. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and sharing your thoughts on uranium and, and how you value the equities and also where you think the price is going. Once again, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Happy to, happy to be here. Hi, David, and thank you for joining us today. Hey, Jimmy, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. David, we have a lot to discuss in a short period of time, so why don't we just start it off with a brief overview of Denison Mines and maybe just a little bit of the history behind the company. Well, Jimmy, if we went into the history, we'd be, we'd be here for an hour, but um, today, uh, Denison Mines, were a diversified developer uh, multi-assets focused in the Athabasca Basin region in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, our strategy is around developing one of the lowest cost uranium mines um, at the right time in the cycle. And so our flagship asset is a company called or a project called Wheeler River. Uh, we have an effective 95% interest in that project. And we've taken it from discovery all the way through uh, through PEA, PFS, and now recently announced that we're launching a feasibility study for the project while we've already been in the permitting process for the last few years. Now that's our anchor, uh, but as I said, we are a multi-asset company. So another uh, important asset in our mix is a 22.5% interest in the McLean Lake Uranium Mill uh, and the McLean Lake Joint Venture. Now our partner there is Arano, one of the world's leaders in uranium mining, uh, and they operate that mill currently processing ore from the Cigar Lake mine under a toll milling agreement, the only operating uranium mill in the Athabasca Basin region. And important for us, the fact that it has excess licensed capacity today. Now I kind of round out the picture with a few other assets that fit into our development profile. Uh, we have a, a 66, 67% interest in a project called Waterbury, where we have another uh, PEA stage project for ISR mining. Uh, that is square in our development profile. It's called the THT deposit. 
and then add in some of the other projects that we've acquired over the years like Midwest and McLean to give us really that sort of development portfolio rather than just a single project uh, company. Last part I'd flag just in terms of where we are today and our asset mix is we have acquired two and a half million pounds of physical uranium. And that is a bit unique for a development company. And I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit, but a really important asset on our balance sheet as we move forward with the development of Wheeler River. That's great. Well, that's a lot of information to unpack. So let's start with Wheeler River. That's your flagship property, as you mentioned, but it's comprised of two different deposits, the Griffin and the Phoenix. And you're going to use two different mining methods on each of these deposits. So let's start with the Phoenix deposit. You're going to use in situ or ISR. And this has never been used before in the Athabasca Basin, but it has it, or it is used extensively in other parts of the world and it can be quite profitable. So why don't we just touch on that and just give us a brief overview of ISR and what exactly it means. Yeah, no, that's that's a great, great introduction. Uh, look, in situ recovery is the uh, most prominent mining method for uranium in the world. Uh, it's not been used in the Athabasca Basin, and part of that's because uh, the Athabasca Basin is not textbook for the application of ISR. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, we've spent uh, several years now uh, advancing this idea of bringing the world's lowest cost uranium mining method to the Athabasca Basin where we have the highest grade uranium deposits. And when you really drill into, I'm sorry for the pun on that, but when you really drill into how ISR mining works, I mean, you need uh, permeability, you need leachability, and you need a way to contain your mining solution. And in the in the basin, the containment has always been the concern in that the geological uh, setting of many of the deposits is not textbook and that there isn't a containment around the mining horizon. Normally that's created in, in say Kazakhstan or the United States by, by just the geologic formation itself. Now what we've done is we're bringing uh, an established mining technique which is ground freezing that's used every day of the year in the Athabasca Basin right now, MacArthur River Cigar, and we're going to bring that into the ISR picture, and that's what changes everything for the application in, in the Athabasca Basin. So at the end of the day, what we'll be looking at for our ISR operation is a series of borehole wells, no different than any other ISR operation, and those wells will take the form of either an injection well or a recovery well. Injection well, you'll be pumping in a mining solution. In our case, it'll be an acidic solution. That solution is going to percolate through the natural permeability and some of the enhanced permeability that we'll create in that ore body. And as it moves through that permeability, it's gonna dissolve the uranium or leach the uranium that's already in that host rock. On the other side, we've got a recovery well that's gonna be pumping that uranium rich solution up to surface. And on surface, then we're left with a very simple processing plant because we've already done the heavy lifting in normal mining processes and that we've already gotten to leaching. You know, we didn't have to uh, excavate rock, we haven't had to crush or grind it. We're taking a uranium rich solution as if it came out of a leach vessel, and now we're just precipitating out the uranium and moving through calcining, drying, and packaging. And then taking our mining solution that's now stripped of the uranium, refortifying it, and sending it back into the well field. And most of that's not that different from conventional ISR, but for the fact that we have very high grade ore. And so there's a lot of uranium where we're putting our mining solution. Normally, uh, these well fields would be large and spread out over many square kilometers because the grade of uranium is very low. Often in ISR, you'll be measuring in parts per million. And so the task is to search and destroy uh, and find that uranium. Here, we know exactly where it is. It's in a very tight area. And as we inject that solution, we'll immediately begin leaching because we're gonna be in very high grade areas. Some of these areas will be grading you know, 40, 50, 60% versus PPM. Now that footprint, and, th and this is the last part of the story here, but that footprint is important because the fact that it's compact allows us to use the ground freezing to surround the entire deposit with a fence of freeze holes. And so it creates a freeze wall and that effectively is creating an underground leach vessel. Take the basement rocks underneath the deposit, which are competent. You freeze the ground all the way down from surface around your deposit, and you mine within that vessel. And so that's 
what our high-grade Athabasca Basin ISR will look like. A lot of things that have been borrowed from existing ISR elsewhere and existing ground freezing that's being used in the Athabasca Basin, but would definitely be its a first of its kind in the Athabasca. And David, uh, two questions. First of all, so that's what you're going to use on Phoenix, but on Griffin, you're going to use a traditional underground mining method. Why can't you use ISR on Griffin? Jimmy, great question. It's it's all about geologic setting. So with Phoenix, our deposit is largely hosted within sandstone in a highly disrupted area on top of those competent basement rocks. Okay, so this is an area that's bad for underground mining because it's water saturated, it's all broken up, it's difficult. I mean, you can look at Cigar Lake, similar sort of setting, mine flooded three times. Over at Griffin, we are situated in basement rock. So that unconformity and that sandstone's above us and we're in the competent basement rock, which is suited you know, really quite well to underground mining because we've got that competency. And it's less suited to the ISR because we don't have the permeability that you have in that water saturated sandstone. And for ISR to work, we've got to move the solutions through the rock. For underground mining to work, you need competent ground. And so the two are just different because they are different deposits in different settings. Great explanation. And uh, one more question before I move on, but we should also touch on the economics associated with ISR versus traditional underground mining. How much better is the ISR method? It has the potential to be the best in the world uh, for Phoenix. You know, it takes uh, a combination of things, but you know, the capex is so different in ISR up front. You know, there's no there's no pit to dig, there's no shaft to sink. There's no underground mine workings to develop before you get to first ore. Uh, with ISR, we have an estimated upfront capex at, at Phoenix in the range of 320 million Canadian. And that compares to other sort of greenfield development projects in the Athabasca Basin, where you're looking at price tags well over a billion. Even Griffin, if we do the side by side, you know, Griffin, uh, we don't have to build a mill. We've modeled that we would use the capacity at McLean Lake for that for milling, but the mine itself is in the $700 million range upfront capex because of the nature of underground mining and, this, and having to sink shafts and vent raises. But with the ISR, that upfront capex so much lighter, and then the operating costs. You know, you're using pumps and solution with a very minor processing plant, minimal surface impact, minimal energy consumption, and with our super high grades, uh, we're able to potentially realize the lowest operating costs in the industry. Our PFS estimates operating costs for Phoenix in the range of just over $3 US per pound. And then when we tack on all of the capital, sustaining capital and initial capital, we're still coming in under $9 US per pound at Phoenix, which could make it uh, right amongst the lowest cost all in in the world, even with the best assets in Kazakhstan. And you just mentioned or touched on the feasibility study. What's the timeline associated with that, David? Jimmy, look, it's it, it'll take what it takes. Um, you know, we haven't guided on, on completion at this point, but what I will say is that um, we've taken, again, a deliberate strategy and view around how this is going to come together. So, it's, it's, it's meant to be a, a consultative sort of process in connection with the environmental assessment. We, we are doing our feasibility in a way that will be informed by the assessments we've done over the last several years and the consultation that we've been involved in with interested groups, uh, whether they be indigenous parties or, or regulators. So look, I'm, I'm expecting that we're somewhere in the 12 to 18 month timeframe generally on the feasibility study but it, it will be what it is based on uh, that work that we'll have to take in the actual engineering, but also that work that we plan to incorporate from our consultation. David, that's a great overview of Wheeler River. Let's move on. As you mentioned on the onset, you also have an extensive portfolio of, of uh, exploration assets, and I wanna to touch on this. So why don't you just give us a brief overview of some of those assets, including Waterbury, McLean Lake, and Midwest? Jimmy, look, we've got a big portfolio of exploration ground. I mean, we were a consolidator uh, for many years in the Athabasca Basin, and uh, we've got a large land position, some of which are more advanced than others. And so I like to think of it as a bit of a development exploration portfolio, 
Um, we are exploring on Wheeler River and we are exploring in on, on the Moon South project this year. Uh, and we will always have a slant towards exploration uh, around, because we see the value we can create, right, from a discovery. Uh, our focus is on exploration right now for ISR amenable or potentially ISR amenable deposits. We think that uh, that is a competitive advantage for us to be able to assess deposits from an ISR standpoint. And we really like the profile uh, and the economics that we can pull out of ISR deposits. And, and so that's a good pivot to Waterbury where um, here's a project that we own together with the Korean uh, nuclear power utility KHNP. We've got about a 67% interest there. Two deposits on the project. Uh, one was formerly known as the J-Zone. We've renamed it the Teheldeth Tue or THT deposit following the completion of a PEA. And that's a, a Dene name uh, for, for the area. Uh, and that's a result of our consultation activities um, through the PEA. But this is a very powerful example of what ISR could do from a development standpoint in our portfolio. Uh, THT is around 10 to 12 million pounds at 2%, and again, hosted in sandstone in that difficult ground for underground mining. It's, it's understood to be sort of the Western extension of the Rough Rider deposit, with a view that it would never really be developed without Rough Rider being developed. Now we've totally changed the game on that deposit with this study using ISR because you know, our model is uh, use the ISR, a lot of the things we've learned at Phoenix, but have this, process, the, this project send this material, uranium bearing solution to McLean Lake, which is very close by, rather than building our own processing plant for THT. And that's allowed us to produce actually very interesting economics for such a small deposit. So just to tease everyone, and I won't go into much more detail, but this project has the potential to produce an all-in cost pound of uranium under $25 US, which would put it in the bottom quartile of most cost curves uh, that people are running for the industry. Now to have 10 million pounds at 2% do that is really eye-opening for the potential of ISR. And again, it's just that light capital intensity up front and those low operating costs. We wish we had more pounds there for sure, but you know, to be in the bottom quartile, we can't complain. This is a $177 million NPV in our base case. So that, that's a good example. Look, I'd like to explore ISR at Midwest with Arano, uh, where we've got a 5%, 60, 70 million pound deposit, uh, two deposits there, Midwest Main and Midwest A. And I'd like to explore it at McLean where we've got undeveloped deposits that are very close to the mill. I just think there's so much potential for our existing portfolio with what we're doing with the ISR. David, you have a lot going on right now with Wheeler River and moving that through the feasibility stage. And then you, as you just told us, you have a very extensive portfolio of various assets. And you also have the McLean Lake Mill. But have you ever considered or would you consider selling off some of those assets or maybe spinning them off into a separate company? Definitely something that's been considered. Um, what we struggle with, Jimmy, is the long term. So we are trying to build a company that will be durable and last for the long term. And I look at many of our exploration assets and we like them. You know, we like them for the potential to make discovery. And just like we've talked about, you know, our company sees Phoenix as a catalyst that brings ISR mining to the market. And then we see the value in having a portfolio of assets. And with the ISR, you can be so nimble. And so, you know, it's scalable. It's, 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 it's just not the same kind of commitment you have with these large, uh, very large scale Athabasca, you know, um, giant projects. So we like the idea of a portfolio. We like the idea of making other discoveries. Now that said, it's not that we're opposed to finding the right way to add value for our shareholders with I think assets that probably aren't being valued on their face value when people say, well, look, I'm gonna value Denison on Wheeler River and maybe Waterbury and McLean. You know, hard to say whether we get credit for those exploration assets, but that's our tension is we're saying, look, we would like to have a pipeline of projects. We need to find a few more. So, you know, what's the right arrangement or the right setup to be able to move them into a spin out or something like that where we can continue to participate? Uh, it wouldn't so much be the kind of thing where we would just be distributing it out to our shareholders. We 
because we, we want that pipeline potential in our own story. David, that's a good overview of uh, Wheeler River and your exploration portfolio. Why don't we move on to your balance sheet now? You're cashed up. You you have just over $100 million in cash. You did a raise earlier this year. You raised $86 million for the express purpose of, of buying uranium. And this is something I haven't seen before in other industries, and I'm thinking about precious metals or base metals. Is this a common practice within the uranium sector? And why did you go and use that cash to buy uranium? Well, it wasn't a common practice when we when we did it, um, but it, it became a common practice after we did it. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, companies execute a similar sort of strategy. Uh, look, it's I'll give you a bit of backstory on this. What we're really focused on is developing Wheeler River. Now, I know buying physical uranium doesn't seem to be connected to that, but it really is. Um, we, we saw the market activity earlier this year and we try to be savvy about the way we approach the capital market. The investor interest in our sector uh, in the first half of this year, and it persists now, but particularly in the first half of this year, was very strong around the clean energy transition and the role that nuclear energy could play in that. Uh, we saw a real opportunity to de-risk our future project financing for Wheeler by accessing that depth of investor interest. And our trade-off was this, is, you know, could we take more money? after we did our first round of financing. Yes, there was more money there. There was money for many of names in the space. And I was, I was, I mean, pleasantly amazed by the amount of investor support for our sector. But what would we do with cash? That was our question. Is, is, this, is this the exact right share price to raise money to de-risk the project finance? And we struggled with that. And where that got us to was, okay, but how can we take advantage of this window? And we said, look, the capital's there. What if we grab that capital because it's the right time, it's opportunistic, but what if we put it to work? You know, it's not dilutive if we buy assets of value. And so we went out, went out and we bought two and a half million pounds of uranium at a purchase price under $30 US with a view that it would give our investors similar exposure to the commodity that our company gives them without that extra capital and that it would mean that that capital would be dynamic. It wouldn't sit on our balance sheet as stale cash. It would be dynamic, allowing us to benefit if there was an increase in price in uranium. It was not a speculative call. It was not buy low, sell high. It was where can we store this capital where our investors will be pleased with it. And really, at the end of the day, the plan is not to sell the uranium to raise money to build the project. It's an option. But what we'd really like to do is be able to borrow against the value of that uranium as we fund Wheeler River through you know, a good debt package or whatever it might be. Maybe it's an offtake where we can de-risk the offtaker by already having the uranium. That's something that is totally different in the mining space that I've not seen before, where a developer that doesn't have cash flow can go into project finance and say, but look, I've got a third or maybe half, depending what the uranium price will be at the time, of my project CapEx already on the balance sheet in a physical commodity that the lenders can take security in. That, I think, has the potential to really change the project financing game for us. And I think investors should look at our company as being significantly de-risked. I mean, that uranium represents somewhere between a third and a half of our CapEx for Phoenix. Most developers are not sitting with a third to half of their upfront CapEx on the balance sheet ready. And, and that's really what we were trying to achieve with that, with that financing. David, you recently announced the implementation of an at the market equity offering or an ATM. And uh, that was with Cantor Fitzgerald and also Scotia. But what was the reasoning behind that? Jimmy, we look at the ATM as really the best capital markets instrument uh, for equity offering. Um, it's not for everybody. Your company needs to be in a place where you can file a base shelf prospectus. Uh, we, we have done that now for not the second time, and so we've got good experience with, with that. Uh, but it's really about um, discretionary financing when it makes sense to do it. We will be using, we will be consuming capital. That is the nature of our game as we move our project forward. 
And the ATM gives us an opportunistic tool to be able to replace capital with having a minimal market impact. So you don't have the impact of a big bot deal and a price at discount to market. Uh, you do pay much lower broker fees. So our broker friends may or may not be so happy about that, uh, but our shareholders would be happy about it. You know, you avoid the pressure of having warrants and things like that included because you're actually able to issue that stock into the market. And again, it's at our discretion when we think it makes sense to do that. And I'll give you an example of why something like this is useful. I mean, we didn't expect that we would have an opportunity to buy uh, half of GCU, which owns 10% of Wheeler River. And we were able to execute on that this summer and, and increase our interest in Wheeler River to 95%. But uh, you know, we had that cash on the balance sheet. We were stable and we were able to do that. Now with the ATM, we're able to replace that capital more organically, more subtly without having a market impact. And I think the key with these ATMs is they're for companies that are well capitalized. If, if you're using an ATM as a means to become capitalized, I think it could be complicated uh, in that you know, people will see this as perhaps equity dilution. But for us, we're already well capitalized. The ATM really becomes a discretionary financing tool that we can use to actually benefit our shareholders. And you just touched on this earlier, but we should bring talk about the economics associated with a, a typical bot deal might be five or six percent. That's what you have to pay the broker. Whereas the economics associated with an ATM would be how much? Yeah, you're talking in the range of two percent. And the and the biggest difference, while that's a significant difference, biggest difference is that you're issuing that stock at market uh, and you're not taking a discounted haircut on the actual offering. And so that's that's where things really stack up, right? Discount that stock because you're moving a quantity of it to new investors who want to have that de-risked, plus you pay the brokers because you want that bought deal security. Uh, all of a sudden, you're quickly into double digits in terms of the cost, whereas with the ATM, that stock's at market and the broker commission's much lower. David, as we wrap up here, what can investors expect in terms of news flow in the coming weeks and months from Dennis and Mines? We're, well, as I said, Jimmy, we're active in the field. So look, there's there's news flow through the balance of the year here as we wrap up our ISR field testing at Wheeler River with that tracer test and our commercial scale wells. We're also active right now uh, on the exploration front at Wheeler River and Moon South. So expect uh, results from both of those programs through the balance of this year. And really with us and our de-risking, uh, we're never short of news. So that is an exciting part about being in the permitting development phase for us. Normally permitting can be a bit of a dry period for uh, development companies, but with us and the progress we keep making on de-risking the ISR, we always have these milestones ahead every time we're making a technical advancement or, de or achieving a de-risking milestone, you'll see news from us. And really it's about following us through that as we work through the environmental assessment in parallel with the feasibility study. You should expect a constant flow of news from us over the next you know, 12 to 18 months. That's a great overview and thank you for sharing the Dennis and Mind story with us today, David. And to all the viewers, if you have any further questions for David or his team, send us an email to info at gorestreetcapital.com and we will get you an answer. Or if you would like some research on Dennis and Mines, send us an email and we'll send it along. Once again, David, thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. My pleasure. Ross, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Happy to be here with you. How are things in Kelowna? Things are, are well in Kelowna. Beautiful day um, in the fall. This is uh, vineyard country and uh, the harvesting, I think, is underway. So lots of activity, beautiful part of the world. It's a great time of year. So why don't we begin, Ross, with a brief overview of Fission Uranium and give us a brief background on the history of the company. Sure. Well, Fission Uranium, uh, I guess, has been around for about eight years. We were spun out of another company called Fission Energy, and um, it really focused on the western side of the basin on a new discovery we had called PLS. And, 
you know, that, that was the, the beginning of the discovery of PLS back in 2012, 2013. And so, you know, we've been able to, over the years, grow a, a, a truly significant world-class deposit um, in, in the basin. So, you know, Fission Uranium uh, has one project only, and that is the PLS project hosting the Triple R deposit. So let's talk about the location of fission uranium in the basin and just so we can frame it, where is it in relation to Cameco? So, you know, the, the history of the development in the Athabasca Basin really started off on the eastern side. So the, the first mines in, in the basin would have been the Key Lake mine down in the, in the southeast side of the basin and you had Rabbit Lake in the, on the uh, little bit further to the north. Um, and that's really where Cameco has, uh, you know, a, a, a established their land package. And, and this is where, you know, over the last 50 years, you've had the majority of producing assets in the Athabasca Basin on the eastern side. I would say that um, the western side of the basin, for whatever reason, had been uh, underlooked, underexplored. Uh, some, for some reason, the you know, the, the philosophy was that there really was no appreciable uranium out there um, on the west side to be found. So there hadn't been a lot of exploration activities. Um, Cameco had very little exploration activity out in that side of the basin. But as a small company, you want to take advantage of uh, and do what other people are not doing and think outside the box. Um, I had worked before on uranium properties in the western side of the basin, and there had been the Clough Lake producing mines. So, you know, in my opinion at the time, there, you know, I thought that the west was, you know, just as uh, likely to hold large, high-grade economic deposits as the eastern side. It's just that they hadn't been looked at. So, in fission uranium, we we took advantage of that model, the fact that we were out looking where nobody else was. We did a, uh, we looked around the edge of the basin where we were looking for shallow deposits. And we made a discovery back in the fall of 2012 of high-grade uranium outside of the basin. Um, about a year or so later than that, uh, NextGen made the discovery of the Aero deposit right on trend with ours. It's about uh, three kilometers away from, from Fission's Triple R deposit. And you know, since that time, we've shown that the, the Western side is producing superior deposits to anywhere in the basin. And really, I think, uh, you know, the, the real change is that the, the next generations of mines to be developed will be coming out of that southwest side of the basin. So I think that, you know, from that discovery nine years ago to where we're at now, I think that, uh, you know, that, that's truly the future of the Athabasca Basin. And Ross, how is the southwestern side of the basin different from the east side, just in terms of geology, if it is? Yeah, I think what, what's remarkable is the similarity. Um, you know, we, we're able to have high-grade deposits on the eastern side, and we're also seeing that we have high-grade deposits on the western side. I think the, the real difference is just the underexplored nature uh, on, the, uh, on the western side of the, of the basin. So. Um, you know, our deposit's a little bit different. We're outside of the Athabasca Basin margin itself, so we're in what we call basement rock. Basement rock is a lot more competent. Um, and, uh, you know, if, you can, if you're trying to develop in, in competent rock, it's a, it's a lot less technical risk, a lot less um, expensive, we'll say. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you have a better chance of getting it out of the ground than if you're inside the Athabasca Basin itself with the the problems that you may encounter at the at the bottom of the sandstone in that basement interface where a number of deposits are. But what's unique about us, as I said, we're basement hosted, we're just outside, but we're near surface. And so like grade, the closer you are, you know, it is important, grade is important, but the closer you are to surface, uh, I think, you you know, it also de-risks the project an awful lot and it's uh, less um, expensive to get the ore out. So we're basement, near surface, large and high grade and that's really what uh, you know is kind of unique about the, the project and when you say it's near surface what would the depth be yeah so 50 meters below the surface and in fact the only thing if, uh, you know we have a an overburden layer that's about 50 meters and it's just dirt you know piled up over the last 10,000 years or so 
um, sitting on top of the bedrock. Our deposit starts right at the top of the bedrock. And so the first hard rock that you encounter by mining is actually uh, the ore deposit itself. So very shallow. You know, if you want to compare that to, say, some of the operating mines in the basin right now, um, uh, Cigar Lake is about 400, 450 meters below the surface. Uh, and we're, as I say, 50 meters. So, you know, orders of magnitude closer to the surface. Ross, that's a good overview of the company and the background of the company and also the importance of the Athabasca Basin. Why don't we focus in now on Fission and your Triple R deposit? Can you just expand on that, please? Sure, yeah. As, as I mentioned, you know, we um, we made the discovery back in, in the fall of 2012. We advanced quite quickly, uh, you know, with very successful programs in the early years in 2013, 14, outlining what looked to be a, a truly uh, sizable deposit. Um, we had our first maiden resource back in 2016. The same year we did our, um, our PEA study, uh, sorry, 2015, we, we did our PEA study and then and that was positive. So we moved it uh, along to, to the pre-feasibility study which we completed in 2019. Everything in the pre-feasibility study told us that yes, this is a, a very viable, robust project and that we should be going this next step and that's feasibility. So we've been able to, you know, I, I'd say very successfully each year, just march it further and further down the line. Ultimately, you know, the goal of course is to be a producing asset and, uh, we're, you know, somewhere along the halfway point to that between discovery and, and a producing asset, but um, a truly successful, uh, you know, march along that path, and, and I expect the same as we go forward. So maybe you can just tell us about the five different deposits within the triple R deposit and which ones are included in your mine plan. Sure. So, you know, the, the, um, there are five of them. They all occur, I kind of, into uh, pearls on a necklace. You know, we have a, a blob. The first one is called the, the, the 1515, and then we move into the 840, the 00, and the, the 780 zone, and then the 1620. So they all kind of sit side, you know, along along the same trend in, in blob. The biggest uh, and most important of the zones is the is the R780 zone. That was um, between that and the discovery zone, the 00. Those are the two that have so far in the pre-feasibility study because they've had enough drill holes to, to get the, the kind of data that you need, which is called indicated category of ore. That's just the material you can move forward into the pre-feasibility and feasibility. So the other three zones, we know they're there. We've done enough drilling on them to show that they're inferred resources, but not enough to bring them into indicated. And it's indicated that's required to carry on the, the economic studies. Um, so there really are only the two zones so far that make up the pre-feasibility study. But the, the note that I'll say is that um, the next one in line most likely to be brought into the mine plan is the R840 west zone. So it's, it occurs about 500 meters or so west of the 780 zone. Um, it's been the focus of, of some attention this year. We did some drilling on it and the, the, the aim there is to get enough drill density that we can convert that to what we call the indicated category, bring it into the mine plan. And so if we're successful and we, you know, we, we, we finished the drilling, the modeling works out, we do have indicated, we'll be able to bring that into the mine plan into the feasibility as we move forward. So as you mentioned, the pre-fees was released in 2019. It's a couple of years old now but nonetheless, it can still give us a good backdrop as to the economics. Why don't you just talk about the CapEx associated with this project, the rate of return, and also the payback? Sure, well, you know, the, the CapEx on, on Athabasca deposits is expensive. Um, you know, we're looking at around $1.2 billion in CapEx. Now, part of that is also because we don't have an operating mill on the western side of the basin. You know, these are new deposits, new discoveries. You don't have some of the established infrastructure that you might have on the eastern side. And a mill is 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 a major component of that. Um, so in our uh, in our economic studies, we built in the cost of building our own mill, 
building our own, uh, bringing in power, so generating power on site, um, and these elements. I think that, um, you know, particularly as, as you see the, with the next gen deposit also advancing uh, uh, quite successfully uh, towards production as well. I think hopefully we'll see one common mill. So, you know, the ability to shave off a, a great deal of the CapEx, you know, as we, as we go forward, um, sharing in infrastructures, uh, mill, power, you know, all, all kinds of things. Um, but I, I, so that's the pre-feasibility is really based as a standalone project there, 1.2 billion CapEx. Um, what's truly remarkable here is the very, very low cost uh, projection for operators. So we're looking at um, operating costs. We're looking at just over $7 a pound U308 to, uh, as an operating cost on, the, on the, the triple R deposit. That would put you in with some of the lowest cost producers in the world. And, uh, you know, and I think that that's really what, what makes, not only do you have a big deposit, high grade, but very low cost. So, you know, the economics obviously have been very, uh, very impressive. We're looking at a 25% uh, IRR after tax, um, you know, and, and an impressive M MPV of around $700 million. So, you know, I'd say the economics are, are very robust and that's the reason that we're moving forward with the feasibility study uh, to, basically support that that study and get it up to the level that's that's needed in order to make a production decision. And Ross, I just want to put that seven dollar number into perspective. How would that compare to Cameco's Cigar Lake? So Cigar Lake and MacArthur, the um, you know MacArthur's on hold for the moment. Uh, but those assets would be producing uranium at around 14, 15, 16 dollars a pound uh, U308. So we're looking at, you know, potential operating costs of about half of that uh, for for Cigar Lake. And I think a lot of the reason is it's less complicated. It gets back to the, the argument I, I made a little bit earlier about being in basement rock, less technically challenge uh, challenging to get it out of the um, to get it out of the ground. And um, you know, it's it's just lower cost operating to be in basement rock. So. Yeah, we're looking at a pretty favorable uh, scenario for the triple R. So as you mentioned, you've commenced a feasibility study. Why don't we just talk about the timeline associated with that and, and when do you expect it to be released? Sure, so the feasibility uh, study, which we just started embarking on this summer, um, it's probably around an 18 month uh, period in order to have all the feasibility work completed, the report uh, done and submitted. So I'd say by the end of 2022, feasibility is projected to be finished. Um, but that sort of opens a door into the next phase of work, which is the on the permitting and the EIS side. So once feasibility is done at the end of 2022, we enter into the environmental impact uh, assessment phase which is probably about a three year period. So uh, coming out of the successful permitting side, we're looking at around 2026 by the time um, this project is ready for construction to, to become a producing asset. And, uh, and what we've seen out of the pre-feasibility, that's about a three year period to, uh, to get into production. So producing asset towards the end of the decade, so 2029, somewhere in that, in that, uh, that frame. So once again, construction would start in 2026 Correct. and then production 2029. Correct, yeah. Three years from the, the start of uh, uh, you know, uh, construction to uh, the, the ore coming out and, and through the mill. I wonder, I wonder what the price of uranium will be in 2029. Yeah, I think it's going to be quite good. You know, we've seen uh, what it can do um, in a very short period of time, you know, just over the last, uh, whatever, call it a month, we've seen the price go up uh, $20. So it's moved from low 30s into, um, you know, low 50s, high 40s uh, in a very short period of time. Um, it does show you the vol volatile nature of the price and that it really, once it gets going, there's, there's a lot of torque. I don't know what it's going to be in 2029, but we're really at the point right now, we're pretty close to where we've done our, um, you know, that we use as a base model for our PFS study, you know, which is uranium at $55 a pound. Well, that's 
kind of where it's trading at right now. So, um, you know, forward looking, it, it could be anywhere, but I think the, the, the answer is north of where it is right now. Let's hope so. So you recently released the results of a 25 hole drill campaign. And I believe that those holes, they were focused on the R840 zone. Is that correct? That, that's right. Yeah, they, they really were. And, and, you know, as I mentioned, what they're, the aim for those 25 holes was to have enough drill hole density in the R840 zone that we can convert that to indicated. Um, our holes hit where we expected them to. Um, the results were uh, overall really, really good, we think. We're still waiting for confirmation from assays, but the radioactivity and, uh, uh, you know, we, we know the strength of radioactivity and how that relates to grades. So I think we're pretty encouraged with what we've seen. Um, you know, it'll, it'll still take uh, looking at the overall results and modeling it to see how it fits in, if we can convert to indicate it. But I think, um, I think we've done a good job at, at that. And so, you know, very likely the feasibility study resource will include the, the R840. And certainly that's the goal. And I think we're, uh, you know, a long way to achieving that. So that was what the summer program was all about that we put news out about uh, two or three weeks ago. So we did a great overview of the, the history behind the company and also the importance of the Athabasca Basin and the economics associated with the, the project. Why don't we move on now to your balance sheet and also your shareholders and how much cash do you currently have on hand? So we have uh, $50 million in the treasury right now. So we're, we're doing really well. You know, that's uh, certainly enough money. Um, to get us through the uh, feasibility work next year, you know we're we're not uh, yeah we're not hurting at all in in, in, the, in that department. I think we're doing quite well. So strong balance sheet, and um, so, you know we're, we're very comfortable with where we're sitting. You recently did a raise in the month of May. You raised thirty four million dollars. Can you give us a little bit of color on that? What sort of demand did you have? Was it institutional? Was it retail? Canadians? Americans? Yeah. Demand was instant. You know, when we put the, uh, you know, the, the raise out, um, uh, you, you know, it was filled right away. Um, and I, the demand was primarily institutional, and that's something we've been focusing on in the last years, building up our institutional ownership. You know, about a year and a half ago, uh, our institutional ownership was uh, quite significantly below 10%. Now we're... Um, you know, we're sitting at around 20, 20% or so institutional ownership for the shares. Plus, we have a strategic owner uh, with CGN, uh, one of the Chinese state-owned utilities. So between CGN and and, um, and the institutional uh, ownership shares, we're, it's almost half of the, uh, you know, the shareholder base being institutional now. So I'm glad you brought up CGN or China. General Nuclear. I'm not familiar with this organization. Maybe you can just touch on that. They are your single largest shareholder at 15.2%. But exactly how did that relationship start? So, you know, um, if you if you look at the uranium market, and, you know, all eyes have been on for the last 10 years, what is China doing? You know, China's been the biggest growth story out there. Um, uh, in as far as building reactors and where's the future going, uh, you know, who's going to be the largest consumer of, of uh, you know, nuclear fuel for, for power generation? And it is China. Um, there's really two state-owned utilities in, in China, and CGN is one of them, and I guess arguably the biggest of the, of the two, although I think they're fairly similar in size between them and CNNC. Um, but they, uh, you know, they took, they were shopping the world looking for new supply for their, uh, you know, projected build out of, of reactors. Um, and, you know, they, honestly, they, they did a, a pretty thorough review of, of all the uh, sets out there. Um, they, you know, at that time we had just completed our PEA um, and that was when we had more serious discussions with China because they were looking for, you know, source out of North America, um, secure source uh, of uranium for the future. So they've been a, a very important investor right from, you know, for over the last five or six years now. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, 
ultimately they're they're the end source user and, and uh, you know very well capitalized group as well. So you know they're they're good partners to have. And how involved are they, and how often do you speak with them? Well, I speak to them quite frequently. They're not involved on the management side. Um, you know, they're they're an investor in the company. They do have two board seats uh, out of seven, so they you know they do have representation on the board. Um, and we also have an offtake agreement with with CGM. So uh, the offtake agreement is for twenty percent of production. They have an optionality for an additional fifteen. So it, you know, if they exercise that option, they could be up to thirty five percent per year. Um, but they're still paying market prices for the uranium. So they're they're still paying spot price uh, for uranium. But you, you know, you've got a guaranteed con, uh, customer down the road for for a third of your uh, of your production. And I'm kind of, I'm curious, are you able to speak with other strategic investors or do you have some sort of lock up there's, agreement? Yeah, no, there's no uh, exclusivity uh, in with, with CGM. They're just a strategic um, investor from that perspective. Uh, no, we were able to talk to, you know, just about everybody. So, uh, and this is the other thing I think that, you know, makes us unique too. We're, uh, well, we're, I think pretty important is that we're, we own 100%. You know, the PLS project is not a joint venture in any way. We have 100% of the asset as well. So, yeah, I mean, we, we do talk to um, all kinds of strategics and investment houses on a on a regular basis. And did CGN participate in that equity deal that you did in May? No, they uh, they did not participate in the in the last. We did three financings in the last um, call it about a year, I guess. Um, and they didn't participate uh, in the financing. Uh, I think you know participating in financing is is something that happens on a very quick basis. And um, you know they at the time they they weren't able to uh, to participate in, in the in, in the in the rounds. But they still maintain their interest, of course, in the in the company and and realize and recognize that it's uh, it's an important investment for them. Do they have any other investments in the basin? No, no. We're the, uh, as far as I know, we're the only North American investment they have as well. So nothing further in the in the basin, and I and I don't believe they have anything elsewhere. Um, you know, where they they have different investments in other jurisdictions. I think they're uh, in Australia as well. They have some participation, um, and also in Africa. Uh, but in North America, it just fission uranium. Ross, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow over the coming months? Well, we still have our assays outstanding from the, the 840 West Zone drilling that we did, um, which is 25 holes. We also had some mineralization in our uh, met holes or metallurgical holes, um, large salmon metallurgical holes or uh, four of them and some geotechnical holes. So there will be you know, a, a raft of assays yet to come. Um, and then it'll just be, uh, you know, constant updating on on the status of the feasibility and uh, and permitting as as we move forward. So I'd say uh, pretty rich news flow over the next uh, year and a half. Well, Ross, that's a great overview of the fission uranium story, and I want to thank you. If any of our viewers have any further questions for Ross, please send us an email to info at borestreetcapital.com, and we will get you an answer. If you would like some research on fission uranium, send us an email and we'll send that along. Once again, Ross, thank you. Thank you very much, real pleasure. Hi, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Jimmy, thanks. Great to be here with you. Tim, before we do a deep dive on ISO Energy, I want to highlight your background. You have a very unique background in that you worked at Cameco for over 20 years, and a big part of your job there was marketing and also trading in uranium. So you have a good sense of how utilities react, especially during 
volatile times like we've seen recently when the price of uranium has gone from 30 to $50 a pound. But how do you think the utilities are reacting to this sudden price movement that we've seen and this new player in the market? And do you think they're concerned at all about what's happening in the spot market or do they only focus on the term market? Yeah, no, that's a good question, Jimmy. I mean, they're clearly focused on it and they're clearly paying attention. Anytime the price goes up from 30 to $50 in a matter of a few weeks, it raises a lot of attention. And, you know, we've been in such a down market, such a, you know, a downward cycle for, you know, really for 10 years that there's been a lot of inventories available to utilities. There's been a lot of um, actually even different buying practices, traders having material. It's been a lot of this, uh, what people call carry trade deals done where, you know, traders buy material, finance it very cheaply, and, and then they're able to just provide it at a fixed price into utilities. And this is safe material sitting in storage. So that, that material has been available for a long time and, and the price hasn't moved. In fact, it's been very, very soft for a long time. So yeah, the fact that the price has moved, um, you, you mentioned a, a new player, that's, I think you're referring to Sprott, the Sprott Uranium Trust having come in, bought a lot of material, but you know, they bought a lot of material and the price moved very quickly. And there's been other players that have bought material and the price hasn't moved that quickly. And I think it's because the market has become thin. We've we've been you know living off of inventories for a long time. Um, production, primary production has gone way down over the last few years, curtailment by Cameco, by Kazadam Prom. And uh, and and now you know we're seeing somebody goes and buys material, the price moves quite a bit, and and certainly utilities notice that and and they'll start, I'm sure, thinking about uh, their buying uh, even more so than they, I'm sure, they have been in the past uh, year or two. And when you talk about utilities who are the typical buyer of uranium, but who exactly are some of the bigger players in the market? Yeah, I mean, you know, every geographic region kind of has their big ones. I mean, in the States, you know, it's really consolidated a lot over the last decade or two. I mean, in the U.S., the big players like Exelon, um, the Duke Powers of the World, Dominion, these kind of guys. I mean, in, in Europe, obviously, EDF, I mean, the French uh, still get more than, you know, 70% of their electricity from from nuclear. And so that's electricity to France. And, um, you know, in, in, in Asia, obviously, there's two big uh, utilities in China, uh, CNNC, CGN, they're building plants like crazy. So there's there's these big players. And then, there, and then there's a lot of other regional smaller players that might have two or three reactors and, and or even one reactor still there's a few of those utilities um, they're in part, important part of the market though because there is really a very limited amount of customers and they're very you know spread out globally and i'm curious what a typical contract would be in terms of length and also pounds yeah i mean it's changed a lot uh, in years i mean there was a period where you know you kind of made generic you know comments about you know in japan they you know long-term contracts 10 years and and Europe might be a little bit you know shorter and, and the US tended to have the shorter contracts but you know in in, in recent times there's been a, you know a lack of long-term buying and like I mentioned before there's there's been a lot of this carry trade you know material or carry trade deals in in the market that allowed utilities to you know buy in the shorter term fix in some very low prices for a period of time and 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 just keep doing those for you know, on an ongoing basis, really low risk pounds and and very low cost. So um, it, it, contracts have, have certainly shortened in length over time, um, but that's with a, an abundance of inventories available and some, you know, some comfort in the market. So uh, certainly, you know, when you start to see the market turn like this, you know, you have to expect there's probably probably some change ahead as well. Tim, there's talk that there's anywhere from two to four RFPs out there. Is this the utilities just trying to find out what's happening in this new market? They're just testing the waters? Yeah, I mean, I think at any given time, I mean, people talk about there not being a lot of long-term or utility buying. There's always some utility buying in the market, you know, people layering in contracts. These bigger utilities have to keep layering contracts on top of each other to make sure that they're covered. Um, but but certainly there's there's been a little bit more activity in the market lately. Um, yeah, certainly some utilities are looking to you know, maybe try to get into the market before they see even bigger turns or if they think it's sustainable, which many people believe this this uptick is you know, will be sustainable, then, you know, maybe getting in ahead of the curve. And and certainly there's others, the big ones that will go in and test the market 
to see you know what is available who who is out there and who can provide me uh, the, the pounds that I need over the over the period that I need it. Those are great insights, Tim. Thank you. So let's move on to ISO Energy. And why don't we just start with a brief overview of the company? Yeah, sure. I mean, ISO Energy, we're fairly new. We The company's been around since 2016, and it, it was a spin out of NextGen. Um, when NextGen found Aero, obviously a lot of attention uh, went to that, that big project and, and focusing their attention. They had some great properties in the eastern part of the basin, so they spun that out into ISO. Um, really, you know, in retrospect, what's probably at the bottom of the market. So in a lot of ways, it was, it was a tough time, but um, but but really good timing in a lot of ways as well. What, what ISO has done since is been able to, you know, get into the market uh, and buy, buy up a lot of other properties. You know, we, we now have 24 properties, some really good property in the Athabasca Basin, mostly on the eastern side. And, and that's something that even today, there's a lot more activity and interest in the market. You wouldn't be able to pick those up. So they, they started with these great five properties. They picked up a great portfolio. And then um, one of the, the best, of course, being the Laroque East property that we bought in 2018 off of Cameco. The company went in there. Uh, the team really had some, some insight into where they wanted to drill. They, they sunk a hole at the end of the summer uh, 2018 program and hit mineralization, which has become the hurricane zone, which, um, you know, last couple of years has been focused solely on the Rock East and, and hurricane. Uh, summer of 2020, they really uh, had, you know, had some real advancements on that project, hitting uh, grades of, you know, almost 40% over seven and a half meters, you know, three and a half meters at, you know, over 70%. Uh, U308. So some really incredible grades and and that project just continues to kind of grow in size as we as we continue to do work on it. So as you mentioned, the uh, property that you're focusing most of your attention on is the hurricane zone. Why don't you just tell us about some of the holes that you drilled this past summer? Yeah, so like I said, you know, 2020 was a really good um, program for ISO, but we took a step back in the winter uh, and didn't didn't actually drill last winter because of COVID. Uh, just wanted to respect the request of the government to stay out of the north if you could, and and, and the communities, frankly, that we're dealing with. We, you know, uh, they were some of the hardest hit in Saskatchewan and even Canada. So we wanted to be respectful of that. So. Um, coming into the summer, things were looking a lot better. We're back up on uh, the property on the Rock East. We're doing a 30-hole program this summer. We've completed uh, a number of holes already, so we, we released some, some information just on the first four holes uh, a couple of weeks ago. We wanted to just make sure people knew we, we were working. We've, we've already had some good results. We've, you know, the results to the north and the south have already expanded the width of, of the deposit, and, and we've still got uh, a number of holes left to left to do. We're going to be up there really a little bit late. We're, we're drilling. I was up there last week, in fact, for the whole week. The team is working hard. Uh, we've got a great drilling team on two drills. One's really focused on expansion of hurricane, and the other one is more focused on exploration uh, down the conductor at La Rock East, which is really, you know, a, a 15 kilometer uh, conductor to the east of that property. So there's a lot of property to explore. And uh, and yeah, we're 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 they're doing a great job up there on on the rock. So I know it's only early October, but what's the weather like in northern Saskatchewan this time of year? Yeah, you know it, it's incredible. We've had a you know if you're not a farmer, and uh, and aside from the forest fires, we've had an incredibly warm, beautiful summer. But we we did you know struggle with forest fires up north, and and farmers here had a tough had a tough year of drought, but. But even last week, um, we had one day where it was sunny and beautiful and the, the little flies came out again to bug you, uh, which is a, a good sign of good weather. Um, the day I left though, it was raining and, and it was kind of that fall feel in there and you, you, you could have sensed that snow was around the corner, but uh, I'm hearing from the team, it's still, it's still pretty decent up there. Tim, when it comes to the base and both location within the base and also depth is very important. Can you speak to that and do so in relation to the hurricane zone? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, at the end of it all, that's one of the biggest strategic advantages we have in Saskatchewan. I mean, the, the, the deposits in northern Saskatchewan are known to be the best in the world. And it's, it's really for a couple of reasons. I mean, they are the highest grade by far, many of them 100 times the world average of other uranium being mined. So that, that grade alone is incredible. 
Um, the other things that become important is, you know, if you can find those grades in the right geology at, at, at decent depths, um, you know, that's a big advantage. Hurricane, for instance, is only about 330 meters below surface, which in, in the, you know, within the basin, that's actually a pretty relatively shallow uh, deposit. And so that, that's a big advantage when you're, when it comes to the mining piece, you know, down the road. Um, other than that, like the, the jurisdiction itself, you mentioned, you know, location, being in Saskatchewan is a big advantage. I mean, Saskatchewan has been ranked by a number of places as one of the best, um, best jurisdictions on the world to mine, you know, mining journal, I think this year ranked at one, um, Fraser Institute's ranked it in the top three last number of years. So, you know, you, you've got a great supportive, uh, environment to explore and to mine eventually. And, um, you've got the highest grades in the world by far. So as you mentioned earlier, the drilling campaign at Hurricane is still continuing. Are you going to have a winter drilling campaign also? Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, this year we actually, even for the summer program, we expanded it a bit. The last two years have been focused only on La Rock East and Hurricane, given that we found that in 2018. And, and obviously that will continue to be our focus. Um, but we actually spent a little bit of time even this summer at, at back at our Geiger property, which prior to buying Rock East was our was really our top pick. So it was good to get back there. We did a 12 hole program there. Um, you know, we had some decent results that we we want to uh, continue to to look at. We're waiting for assays on that property, and we you know are continuing to wait for assays on the initial holes at at uh, Hurricane as well. But yeah, the plan will be to look at those results, see where we want to, you know, see what kind of results we had. And, and from there, we'll plan out a winter program and subject to, you know, board approval and all that good stuff. Uh, we absolutely plan to get back up there for the winter. Just one more question on the hurricane zone before we move on, but it also borders on a property that's owned by Cameco and Orano. Have they done any work on that property? Yeah, I mean, historically, they've done quite a bit of work and you're right. The, I'm not a geologist, but when you look at you know the drawings of our hurricane deposit so far, it does border right up to the west on the Don Lake property, and it's very clear that there's something on the other side. Um, there's a lot of historic drilling there. You know, a few months ago they hadn't been focusing much attention there. You know, I, I think they're they're starting to look at it a little bit just from you know casual conversations with with the chemical Rano folks. I think you know there might be some interest in going and having a look at the other side. Um, that'll be up to them, obviously, but but obviously that's a big part of the story too, because as we as we go forward and, and finally define the boundaries of Hurricane, and we haven't called a maiden resource yet, uh, it'll be important to know exactly what that story is on the other side as well. If you look, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have such a deposit that you go through into development and and further on. So um, yeah, if 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 work does start there, that'll be a very good indication of uh, of kind of telling the other part of that story. Tim, you mentioned earlier that you do have 24 properties and uh, we've already touched on two of them. I don't yeah. want to touch on all of the other 22, no. but I'm sure there's a couple you want to highlight. What would they be? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're actually going through a bit of a strategic review of, you know, where is it we want to spend our time and money? We're, like I said, we're, we're going to continue to do work on, on La Rock and Hurricane. Hurricane is our focus to find out, you know, exactly how big that deposit is. Um, we do want to continue to explore along that conductor uh on the rock east and and geiger yeah will continue to be important uh to us down the road uh, we'll continue to do work there as well especially having you know had what i think is a successful program this summer um we, we've got some other airborne uh, geophysics planned uh this this fall uh on a property called collins bay extension uh we'll be doing that right away so we'll, we'll determine if we want to get onto that property but that's one of very a uh, lot of interest to us it's on the same kind of uh, trend as as some former mines, Rabbit Lake and others. So, um, and, and there's and there's a lot of other great properties properties in the portfolio. So it's just a matter of again figuring out what we can do um, in a timely fashion with with the capital we have and and where we want to focus our time and resources. Good. So let's move on to your capital and also your balance sheet and shareholders. And I first want to ask about Next Gen. They are your single largest shareholder at 51 percent how involved are they yeah i mean uh they're very very involved they're, they're an important part of the company i mean our our chairman is lee courier who's the ceo of next gen 
probably know uh, we've got board members that are are, are uh, board members on NextGen as well. It's you know it's really what I would consider a strategic advantage. We we certainly get financial support from them. You know, for raising money, they're very interested to maintain uh, a large share of the company. But but even more so, like um, from a technical side, from just a, a day-to-day working side, they're willing to help out if we need you know, another set of technical eyes on, on expiration or just any part of running the company, they're there to help because they're, they're, they're invested in, uh, in the success of ISO. So yeah, they're very, you know, very supportive. They're there whenever we need them. And uh, yeah, I think, again, it's a strategic advantage for ISO. Tim, you're sitting on just over $13 million in cash. Mm -hmm. And how is that money going to be spent between now and year end? Yeah, I mean, we started probably the summer before the summer program with about 15. We're down to about 13.4. I, I suspect by you know the end of the year, we'll probably be, you know right around 10 million dollars by the time we, you know, we spend on our exploration program. Probably around a five million dollar spend this summer, um, and then some options warrants come back in. So you know, we're we're in a good situation financially. We've got uh, yeah, enough money to keep us going this year, and and even through a winter program. Obviously, the market's doing well. There's people that are interested in investing capital into this sector and into ISO. So we'll, we'll look at that. We, we've looked at that from time to time. We don't want to, you know, uh, raise capital just for the sake of raising it. We'll we'll do it when it's, you know, best for the company and 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 uh, and when we need the money uh, to use and and put to put to work uh, for the for the growth of the company. But but yeah, for the time being, we're in we're in really good shape. If you're a shareholder of ISO Energy, you're very happy. The stock is up over 150% year to date. And it was up higher, but it's pulled back a bit. Yeah. But are you getting a lot of calls from, from investors? And if so, are they Canadians, Americans, Europeans? Yeah, I'd say I'd say all over the board. I mean, we, we get calls every day. Um, certainly a lot of you know US interest, which is great. Um, the Canadian market knows, you know, knows us probably the best. And and so they, they probably know the uranium industry in Canada the best. So lots of very supportive Canadian shareholders. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been on a couple of, you know, uh, investor conferences. And when, when you do that, you really, it's, it's, you know, you put together 20 or 30 meetings in two or three days. And it's, it's people from all over the place. I mean, Asia is very interested. There's certainly a lot of, um, you know, great uh, investors in, you know, Europe, Switzerland, Germany that are, that are on the line, interested in the story, and so yeah, I'd say it's it's just it's gaining because it's it's not just people in the past that have been in the uranium sector and understand it. Um, you know, the narrative is changing, right? The the narrative around nuclear and the fact that it's becoming a bigger part of the climate change story, and people are 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 really um, believing that and 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 embracing it, and and also as an ESG investment, like you know, a few years ago that would have been unheard of that nuclear or uranium. Would be considered in that in that space, and, it, and it's starting to. So you're getting a whole different group of investors that are are starting to really want to know uh, what the uranium space is all about. So yeah, it's been it's been really positive. So the Europeans are giving up on gold; they just care on uranium now. Maybe, well, maybe we'll see. We'll see. I'm sure they'll stick with gold, but it's nice to have uranium in the mix there a little as well. Tim, I just want to ask you one more question before we wrap it up, but. You mentioned earlier that you spent 20 years at Cameco. You also worked at Denison, which is mm -hmm. a large developer. And now you've gone over to ISO Energy, which is an explore co. What was it about ISO that attracted you? And why did you not go work for another developer or a producer? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't looking to move at all. I mean, uh, Denison, it was great. They're moving that project along and it's really an exciting project. It was just the opportunity came to me and it was, it was one of those that you kind of go, you know, these don't come along every day. Um, you know, I, I tracked ISO a little bit. I hadn't seen, you know, been following it that closely, but I knew they had this, you know, this new discovery. And when you start looking at it, you go, it's actually in a really unique spot. It's it's really the only company, not just in Canada, but but globally, that's found a new high grade deposit over the last few years. And you know, I, I believe in the nuclear and uranium fundamentals. I, I mean, that's what this is all based on. I mean, you can have these big upticks in price because someone's buying, but it's because the fun underlying fundamentals are supporting that. And, and you've seen it over the last few years, they're really starting to turn in uranium's favor. And yeah, when ISO came, Lee, you know, Lee's the chairman who approached me, it was, it was one of those things where I just knew that 
it was something that would be exciting and 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 a bit of a stretch you got to keep you know kind of stretching yourself uh to kind of grow and i i knew i had experience that i thought could be valuable here but also you know that i would learn a lot of new things which i am every day and uh yeah, so so that's great. And I also the other the other positive was, you know, I am working a little bit with NextGen as they move forward on Aero, uh, providing some advisory services on on the marketing piece. So it was nice to have that piece where I can kind of keep my my finger in the market, which is, you know, continues to be, uh, a, you know, a passion of mine. Tim, as we wrap up, what can shareholders expect in terms of news flow in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, I mean, we're continuing to explore at La Rock East, obviously. So we've put out um, one release on a few holes. We'll we'll continue to share that information with the public as it as it comes as the the holes are drilled, and so you know we'll put out news on that. Um, and then later, as we continue to get the geochemistry work done and the assays are coming through, we'll we'll share that information on not just on Hurricane and the expiration there, but also on Geiger. Um, yeah, so you know, over the next number of weeks and months, there, there should be a lot of information coming out of the summer drill program. And then, of course, like I said, we'll we'll start turning our attention to the strategy and planning to the winter program, and certainly share what we're expecting to do on that front as well. Well, that's a great overview, and thank you for sharing the ISO Energy story with us, and also sharing your thoughts and on the utilities and how they're reacting to this current environment. To any of the viewers, if you have any further questions for Tim and his team, please send us an email to info at wallstreetcapital.com and we will get you an answer to your questions. Or if you would like some research on ISO Energy, send us an email and we'll send it along. Tim, once again, thank you. Jimmy, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Hi, Lee, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jimmy. Great to be on your show. Lee, you've worked in the uranium industry for many years, and you've worked for many different companies in many different uranium producing countries throughout the world. And now as the CEO of NextGen, you're operating in the Athabasca Basin. And let's jump right into NextGen and tell us why it's so special. Yeah, well, look, we, we discovered, based on all of that good work and the geological department in Saskatchewan has, and uh, it really did lead us to, to getting a, a good understanding of some uh, exploration portfolio that you now see in NextGen, which is the most dominant land position in the southwestern section of the basin and very uniquely on the edge of the basin. So uh, it, in principle, if you're on the edge of the basin, you're likely to find deposits at their most shallow. Uh, as you go in the centre of the basin, it starts to get deeper and deeper and obviously uh, mineralization uh, will be less economic. But um, we strategically picked up that portfolio in uh, 2011 and 2012 and set about uh, running additional geophysical surveys over it. And uh, just on that section of the uh, of the Rook One property where Arrow is located on the Patterson corridor, we really did zero in on on getting a, a sound understanding of the the ge geophysical signatures that existed. And uh, with the discovery of Triple R to the south of us along the Patterson corridor, um, we knew we were in the right district. And, uh, and then we set about developing a, a number of targets. And on the very first drill hole on the, that uh, is now Arrow, uh, there had not been a drill hole within a four and a half kilometer radius of, of that target. Um, drilling on the property had previously occurred 30 years earlier. And uh, we hit it with the very first hole, which unprecedented. And uh, it's quite amazing when you consider, even though the deposits are very uh, large and high grade, they are extremely difficult to find, particularly in the basement rock setting. You can miss them by as little as one meter. Uh, that's how, how um, precise they are. But uh, Arrow very quickly showed its um, strength uh, where with the very third hole, we stepped out 200 meters and hit mineralization again. And so we knew we we're onto a significant system, uh, but how significant 
uh, time was time was to tell. And with the 15th hole at the property, we hit a very small slither, uh, about five centimetres width of very high grade mineralisation, which was indicative that we were near a um, very intense mineralising system. And then the 30th hole uh, in, in 2014, uh, at that time was ranked the fourth best in uranium exploration history, uh, approximately 46 metres at over 10%. Uh, that hole now isn't in the top 20. It's fallen out of the top 20 holes and, and Arrow hosts uh, all of the others. Um, quite amazing. And, uh, and so the Arrow deposit has, has um, developed into what is the world's largest uh, highest grade and and uh, given its technical characteristics of being in the confident basement rock so we're in very sound ground conditions it has a very clean metallurgy and and due to its grade it's actually a very tiny footprint it's actually going to be one of the world's tiniest underground mines at about 1300 tons per day and so it has a very um, uh, elite environmental footprint not only from its technical characteristics but also the design parameters which we've put into it, um, where we've made environmental performance one of the, the top objectives with respect to our uh, execution of, of uh, development. Lee, 2021 has been a busy year for you and your team with the highlight being the release of the feasibility study earlier this year. Can you just provide some overview of that study and just give us a backdrop on the net present value of the internal rate of return and also the payback? Sure, so to put it into context, it, it's one of the most uh, economically powerful mineral resource projects in the world across any commodity. Um, for the gold bugs out there, it, it basically um, is averaging uh, over the life of the mine, uh, about 75 grams per ton gold equivalent. Uh, economically, it's an absolute powerhouse. 1.3, and this is all in Canadian dollars, uh, unless I state otherwise, uh, $1.3 billion Canadian capex figure. Uh, it has a payback period of 0.9 of a year. So extraordinarily quick payback period. And having worked on the other side of the fence, financing these types of projects, uh, I've never seen one like Arrow economically. It has an internal rate of return at, uh, at a $50 uranium price over the life of the mine. Uh, and we'll speak about where we see prices going in, in just a moment. But at a, a base case, $50 a pound over the life of the mine. It has a 52% after-tax IRR. And from a free cash flow perspective, over a billion dollars a year in after-tax free cash flow. Now, to put that into context, it'll take us into the top 15 mining companies worldwide on a free cash flow basis, yet uniquely coming from a single asset, which is one of the tiniest underground mines in the world with an elite environmental uh, uh, profile. And that's at just $50 a pound. So it's an incredible opportunity in an incredible jurisdiction. And uh, it, uh, you know, people throw out the terms uh, tier one, uh, I think, with those factors that I've just outlined, uh, I, I deem it the one. So those are very impressive economics based on $50 uranium. But as we both know, the average contract price for uranium was in the last cycle was $75. What happens to the economics then? Yeah, at what well, $75, I, we will elevate from the top 15 uh, in, into the top 10, if not top five. And uh, when we saw uranium go to seven, well, in that average contracting price last time, and we uh, we do have it on a table there and showing the sensitivities of the project, well, the economic returns just um, go to another, another level. Um, yet the mine and the footprint stay the same and the sovereign location all stay the same. And so... When you, when you put that into context, what an incredible opportunity it is for the province of Saskatchewan and also the country of Canada um, uh, it, that we have in front of us. And overlaid on top of that, we're actually generating a commodity which is going to be the, the base of clean air energy fuel worldwide. And it's great to see the pandemic feels like we're almost through it as a, as a, as a, as a planet. 
Um, the next issue that we really do have to face is the, the clean air environment. And to have not just an incredible mining project, um, but to have that overlaid over the top of it, that's gonna be positive for so many people around the globe. Um, that's why the team at NextGen is so committed. We certainly see the responsibility that we have in front of us to do this exceptionally well. And uh, the team is, is dedicated to that objective. And so economically, environmentally, um, socially, it, it's, it's such an incredible uh, opportunity and privilege that, that we all have at NextGen in uh, coming to work every day. Lee, the average annual production for the first five years will be 28.8 million pounds of uranium. And over the life of mine, it will be 21.7 million pounds. Can you just put that into perspective for us? How does that compare to Cameco? Yes, so that uh, production number is based on our feasibility study, which is based purely on the measured and indicated resources. We have an, an additional 80 million pounds in the inferred category that with extra drilling will we'll transfer into the measured and indicated. So you'll, you'll see that production profile change as we're in production, it'll, it'll expand and go for longer. Um, that will take us to, uh, based on those numbers and based on 2019 mined production, which is the last full year of, of production prior to the pandemic would make us around 20% of the world's uh, production. When we look at the production profile of the existing mines around the world, um, I actually think by the time we are in production in the um, early part of the latter part of this decade, um, you'll see that as a higher percentage than, than 20% at those numbers. And, and I, I really wanna be clear with this point for everyone listening is that the production profile of mined production is decreasing between now and when next gen's going in production. And those, those production numbers of, of uh, 28 million pounds per annum is still not going to meet the, the production that is coming offline between now and then. So Arrow is just really going to um, address some of the, the production which is coming offline, let alone the gap between demand and supply in the latter part of this decade. And look, the world's gonna need three to four arrows um, online in the latter part of this decade. And uh, and so, yeah, I know on your show, you've got a number of the other companies here with with Fission and, and Denison as well, um, uh, undergoing development of, of their uranium projects in the Athabasca Basin. And we all, you know, we're all at different stages and offer something different, but uh, it's an incredible opportunity for a number of companies, not just NextGen. And uh, it's uh, full credit to um, the companies that you have on your show, because they're the ones that have been in there, you know, since the early 2000s, con con continuous, continuously, and, and have really shown a lot of resilience and dedication to uh, what we have, you know, uh, we're on the cusp of. Lee, that's a great overview of the feasibility study and the economics. Let's move on. Another aspect to the next gen story is the exploration upside because you and your team have only explored a very small part and you haven't done much exploration in the last couple of years because you've been focused on the feasibility study, but you did announce the new exploration program in July. Why don't we just touch on that and tell us how many meters you're drilling, how many rigs do you have going? Yeah, that's right, Jimmy. Um, we we did we haven't drilled for two years. We've only recently reinitiated uh, re that campaign with two drill rigs. Uh, you, you you quite rightly point out we look we hit Arrow with the very first uh, hole uh, on that target. It was actually the 21st hole on the property um, that we'd ever drilled. It's an enormous property as well. And we're just talking about the Patterson Corridor alone where we've only really explored 10% of the Patterson Corridor. But we've actually got another eight corridors on the Rook One property, which uh, we haven't even touched. So we've got 90% of the Patterson Corridor, but we've got another eight of nine uh, corridors on the property, which we haven't even touched yet, which is, look, for everyone looking at looking at the the profile of the property it's clearly the most prospective on the planet for uranium uh, mineralization and 
So we, uh, with the engineering study uh, completed in February of 2021, we're on the uh, final stages of drafting our environmental impact study. Uh, it was time to reinitiate the, the exploration campaign. I want to be clear here, we have bold uh, perspective here. We are not looking just to incrementally increase arrow. We're looking for new arrows with these two drill rigs. And so one of the areas we're looking at is below the arrow mineralization, because there's a geological basis that uh, arrow is the, the top of a much broader system at depth. Um, no, if we are to discover anything down there, uh, it's going to take time to develop because it, it's below arrow and, and uh, below a thousand meters, but it'll be highly economic now that we've established the arrow deposit on its own with all that infrastructure in place, et cetera. Any type of mineralization that we find from here is going to be highly beneficial to the, uh, to, uh, to the project and investors. And so we're looking underneath arrow. We're also looking uh, along strike from arrow at a couple of areas which we, we have uh, poked some holes in in the past, but uh, back in 2015, but that's when Arrow was going, you know, developing at such a rate of knots, we we pulled the rigs prematurely and brought them to Arrow to help define up the resource. So there's a, there's a number of targets that we've been, you know, uh, the, the geological department's been pressuring us to get back to as soon as they can, and, and we'll be touching on those uh, during this campaign. The campaign is 12,000 metres, 6,000 of it under Arrow um, and uh, and the balance on the regional uh, targets along the Patterson Corridor. But I, I think you, know, you can see us having uh, at least two rigs operating continuously uh, throughout 2022 um, because, look, it, it, uh, it, there's so many targets um, and we, we would like to have a, 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 a full understanding of what we're dealing with here, but look, to give it some context, we could have 10 rigs drilling for 10 years, 24-7, 365 days a year, and still not complete the full geological assessment of the Rook One property. It's, uh, it's that extensive. So as you said earlier, you have measured and indicated reserves of 210 million, another 80 million pounds in inferred. And like you said, you have only drilled 10% of the Patterson Lake corridor. So, what's the blue sky? Oh, it, uh, it's enormous. Uh, I think there's undoubtedly, you know, the history of exploration on the property, how quickly we hit what is the world's, you know, largest, highest grade uranium project. It's an in, incredible environmental setting. Um, yeah, I, I think it's enormous. And uh, one, one, one point I'd, I'd also make is that, look, the MPV of Arrow is incredible. Um, and the way things are moving though, and, and the, the value that is getting placed on companies that are generating like uh, very good environments for the, for the earth. Yeah, I, I think there's a bit of a shift towards weighting the value of a company towards its, its ESG component. And, and I think, not only is the MPV impressive of next gen, but that ESG component is as well. And I think you're going to see that that uh, value uh, over time. And uh, you know, it's we're in the very very early days of our company's development. Lee, that's a great overview. And now I want to move on to your balance sheet and also your shareholders. You're cashed up with over two hundred million dollars. How are you going to allocate that capital? Yes, we have two hundred million. Uh, in cash uh, as we speak we uh, have ongoing the environmental uh, impact study which we're nearing completion we've got front end engineering design which uh, we've currently initiated which will you know get the design level to a very fine level of detail and then we also in our feasibility study showed that we there was 158 million of pre-commitment uh, capital works such as an airstrip uh, surface clearing. We've actually even started that um, over the course of the, the third quarter of 2021 with very detailed uh, geotechnical drilling for the foundations um, for the mill and, and the mine. And so you'll see that um, continually uh, executed uh, over the, the uh, 2022. 
and uh, and so we're well funded into 2024 with all of our current uh, plans and and objectives, and uh, looking forward to uh, to getting into it. So in March you did a raise of 172 million dollars, and a lot has happened since then. But how did that raise go? Did you see a lot of new institutions come in, and if so, where were they from? Were they U.S. or uh, Europeans? Yeah, it, it, it's a very good aspect of, of that. We look, we experienced back in November of last year with uh, Boris Johnson uh, very clearly committing to uh, nuclear energy. I see this morning that uh, he's announced that their energy will be fully renewable or nuclear by 2035. Uh, then Biden uh, became president of the United States, doubled down on clean air energy. Uh, with a very strong commitment to nuclear energy. And, and around that time, we started receiving a lot of inbound calls from ESG funds and, and generalist funds. And uh, that's never happened um, in, in uh, well, my career, which uh, started in Uranium back in 2002. And, and those calls have been growing and growing over time um, or since November of last year, because it, it really does feel like the appreciation for just the power of nuclear energy in terms of generating baseload um, electricity uh, without uh, emitting carbon emissions is, uh, is, is really getting accepted based on the science, finally, which is, which is the key here. And so we've had a lot more calls from ESG funds and also generalist funds uh, since November of last year. And the 172 million that we raised um, in uh, March of 2021, we had a number of new entrants um, into uh, on the share registry. Also with Li Kaohsiung, uh, CEF Holdings, uh, converting their debt uh, to equity, uh, currently have 19.9% uh, of, uh, of the company, but we have all of their voting rights. Um, I think over the last 12 months, you've seen our share registry become less uh, dominated by mining focused investors and with a higher percentage of generalist and ESG focused investors uh, entering in the story. Well, you raise a very good point there because I think people are waking up to the fact that even though you talk about renewable energy and it sounds good, wind and solar alone aren't going to cut it. Solar's only um, you can only generate power from solar 20 to 30 percent of the time, whereas nuclear goes 24/7. Yes, exactly, and I, I, I think there's been no better test than a pandemic to show the value of of nuclear energy, how it stood up um, even during a pandemic. And uh, look, technologies uh, for wind and solar need to continue to be developed, etc. But it, it, you've just hit the key point, Jimmy today and forecast for the next 10 to 20 years, that technology in wind and solar needs to really develop before it can be heavily relied upon. You've got to have a, uh, a mix of energy sources and, and in terms of base load and um, carbon free, it's, it's nuclear energy or hydro if the, if the landscape uh, nearby a city um, facilitates it. So you touched on this earlier, but you said your next big permit is the environmental impact statement. And remind me again, when is that due? So we are in the final stages of drafting our uh, environmental impact study. Uh, it's a large document, but, it, but it's one we've been working on for over five years, uh, incorporating all the data dating back to 2013. And we're in the final stages of that. Uh, we'll be submitting that shortly after uh, it's completed at the end of this year. And then uh, we'll be undergoing the uh, regulatory review process. But um, it's fair to say we've been working side by side with the regulators for that last five years. They've got a very good understanding of what they're about to receive. And really to put that in the context, the EIS is formal documentation of that process that we've already gone through. So uh, we're looking forward, it's a, going to be a very significant milestone for the company. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, having that submitted. And then uh, there'll be a public review period. And, uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, approval thereafter. 
So once you get all your permits, what's the best case scenario in terms of timing for construction and then ultimately production? Well, it, it, it's another good point, Jimmy. We will be uh, uh, executing on our pre-commitment early works, that $158 million worth of spending in parallel to that permitting process. We are extremely confident with the permitting process based on all of our feedback. And uh, we are doing that with confidence. So the permitting process uh, can take a, a period of time. Uh, it won't inhibit the pre-commitment early works that I've, I've discussed. Um, and so the construction time for the project is 46 months. And uh, so when we'll, we'll be precisely in, in uh, production, time will, will tell, but we're extremely confident for the, the early part of, of this latter part of the decade, um, post 2025, um, somewhere in the latter part of that decade, but we're very confident it'll be in the earlier part of, of, of the latter half. And so um, uh, we look forward to going through this process. We've got enormous confidence around it. Uh, the government's um, support for the company and the project as well is, is very well understood and, and also the local communities as well. So it, um, it's an exciting period for, for uh, everyone and all stakeholders. Um, the, the population of Saskatchewan and Canada and um, yeah, we, we uh, are very excited about it. We've seen a lot of m and I want to digress now from NextGen. And, and get your thoughts on M&A. We've seen a lot of this in the precious metals uh, sector here in the last couple of years, but we haven't seen any in uranium. And given that we just came out of this low point in the cycle where prices were very distressed, are you surprised we haven't seen some of the majors come in and, and buy some of the developers or Explorcos? Yeah, look, it, it's an interesting point. And uh, look, I, I think with uranium being so flat, for 10 years and it's only recently with the, the Sprott Uranium Trust initiating or, or launching a mechanism that is going to lead to a greater price um, transparency, which I think is in the interest of all uh, market participants. Uh, I think you will see that, that interest increase um, as uh, over the coming period. Um, uranium has been at historically low levels, uh, but um, you know, with the supply, demand and supply situation the way it is, I think you're going to see larger entrants and not just from a, an economic point of view, but also, you know, from a green energy point of view, um, battery metals, clean energy. Um, I think you're going to see more interest from those major mining companies that uh, not only are in uranium, but also uh, not in uranium. And I think uniquely Arrow, you know, is the first first time there's been an asset like us which in uranium hasn't required any level of sophistication. Um, it's in competent basement rock with a very clean metallurgy in an incredible um, environmental setting and sovereign location. And with the um, movement so heavily weighted towards ESG reporting, uh, I think it's just uh, around the corner. The other aspect which I think is interesting is, look, oil companies um, have enormous pressure on them to uh, improve their carbon emitting profile. Uranium mining, it's a fuel, energy fuel, uh, and it can help uh, offset a lot of that carbon emitting um, aspect from, from producing oil. Lee, as we wrap up, what can shareholders expect in, in terms of news flow here in the coming weeks and months from NextGen? Yes, we, we actually have our maiden sustainability report in the final stages of, of drafting as well. So we're, that'll be based on 2020 numbers where look, we had a pandemic activities at site were very, very minimal, uh, but it, it's going to provide investors a real foundation as to how you know we are uh, conducting ourselves and I think we have one of the best ESG stories in the entire sector and and so uh, that's going to be a, an excellent document which is to be published shortly. Finalisation of the EIS, one of the most major milestones in, in the company's history today, uh, that's just around the corner and we've got two drill rigs drilling consistently. If we hit 
any type of mineralization, it's going to be material and we'll be coming to the market with it. And so, uh, yeah, we've got a number of aspects on, on, uh, at the company which uh, is going to generate um, news flow uh, consistently um, from now um, going into the, into the future. And so incredibly exciting time at the company. And, uh, and I, I should also add, we're continually building the team as well. Um, and uh, so that's exciting as well. And uh, both uh, product, predominantly in, in Saskatoon, but uh, we've also recently engaged uh, some, some um, uh, executives that are in other parts of the world, um, closer to the markets, the, the nuclear fuel markets. And so uh, it's a very exciting time. Well, Lee, that's a great overview of the Next Gen story, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us today. To all the viewers, if you have any further questions for Lee and his team, send us an email to info at bloorstreetcapital.com, and we'll get you an answer. Or if you would like some research on Next Gen, send us an email, and we'll send it along. Lee, once again, thank you for making the time today. Thank you very much, Jimmy. appreciate your support and all the investors' support. Hi, John, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. John, Sprott Inc. has just over $17 billion in assets, and a large chunk of that, about $12 billion, is allocated toward the physical trust business, mostly in gold, silver, and platinum. But you also recently started a new product, the Uranium Trust. And why don't we just start there and give us a brief overview and the history behind it and what was the catalyst for starting it? Sure. Yeah. So as you mentioned, um, Sprott's very well known for managing a suite of precious metals uh, commodity funds. And these are very unique in that they only hold physical metals fully allocated and segregated and stored at the Royal Canadian Mint. And, you know, we thought given the success we have with this suite of funds, what other commodities could we put into this, this type of uh, vehicle? And one of the commodities we identified that we thought was a good candidate was physical uranium. And a few years ago, we started to do work on, on whether we could launch a new uranium trust. And at that time, uranium, unfortunately, was in a pretty, pretty uh, bare, you know, very deep, long, bare market and decided that trying to get a new trust off the ground from scratch was going to be a very difficult undertaking because of timing. Um, so as an alternative, we started to pursue Uranium Participation Corp, which has been around uh, since 2005. So we made the acquisition for Uranium Participation Corp. It, had, it gave us a great starting point. It had 18 million pounds of physical uranium in it, and obviously a very long history. And given our experience and expertise in the physical commodity side, you know, we had a number of different ideas on how we could make the vehicle uh, more shareholder friendly, more transparent, more liquid. And, uh, and more efficient at raising capital. And that's exactly what we, uh, we did with the reorganization of UPC into the new Sprott Uranium Trust, which started uh, trading on July 19th of 2021. And what is the AUM? When you took it over, what was the AUM of UPC and what is it now? Sure, so when we took over the, uh, the company and reorganized it, there was approximately 630 million US dollars of assets. There was about 18 million pounds of U308. And then you fast forward to, you know, end of September and uh, the AUM of the fund is around 1.4 billion. And you might say, well, how did that happen in such a short period of time? And it was really twofold. Uh, one, the price of uranium has gone from kind of the low 30s up until today, I would say it's trading around 43, $44 a pound. Um, but as early as last week, it, you know, it hit $50 a pound. So we've had this big lift in the price of uranium. And second of all, uh, we've implemented something called an at-the-market uh, capital raising mechanism, which allows us to issue new shares in the trust when it's accretive uh, to do so. And through that mechanism, we've raised a little over 400 million US dollars. 
uh, which we think is just fantastic in terms of the investor interest we've seen. Um, post, post the reorganization, there was a lot of pent up interest in the trust and uh, investors are expressing their interest by, by buying new units in the trust. So you just said that you activate the ATM when it's creative to do so. Does that mean when it's trading above NAV? Exactly. So we have a fundamental test each day where uh, we have to we have to ensure that any new units that are issued are at a higher price than than the prior day net asset value. And speaking of the net asset value, this is really a key enhancement we we implemented with the trust, and that is every night we publish a net asset value. And for context, the predecessor vehicle UPC would do a monthly net asset value. And we think this change is really important because one, it allows the ATM to operate, but more importantly, it gives transparency to all investors around exactly what is the value of the underlying assets within the trust. And they can gauge how the fund is trading each day in the market relative to the implicit value or, or implied value of the trust. So. Um, this is really important for price discovery in terms of investors understanding exactly how the how the trust units are trading. Are they cheap or are they or are they expensive relative to that implied value? And I do I do think it gives the marketplace a, a heightened level of confidence around exactly what they own and 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 how to how to you know trade the how to trade the fund more effectively. So in addition to the trust trading above NAV. What about the price of uranium? Does that also come into effect? And also, do you have to have supply somewhere like in the horizon before you initiate this ATM? Sure, that's a great question. I mean, uranium is a very different commodity market than when than we're used to. Um, you know, we're used to being able to track, uh, uh, transact in very large volumes in very short periods of time in the precious metals markets. And uranium just does not move that quickly. It's uh, it's obviously a, a, a byproduct of uh, buying in the utility by the utilities, which you know are not in any rush to do so. Uh, so everything moves a little slower. You're, de you're dealing with a lot more time zones. Um, but it is important, getting back to your question about having some line of sight on the material and where someone is, is willing to let go of that material to the trust. So we're constantly mindful of where's the trust trading relative to its NAV, and where could we put? Uh, where do we? Where do we think we'd have to spend uh, per pound to buy more 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 uh, uranium to back the units that we would be issuing? So it is a, it is an important consideration. And remind me again, did you say you have acquired 10 million pounds? Yeah. So that when we acquired the trust originally, there was about 18 million pounds of U308, and um, since August 17th, we've added uh, about 10.3 million pounds. So the fund is over 28 million pounds of U308. So just to give you some perspective, uh, from 2005 to the middle of 2021, it took UPC that period of time to accumulate 18 million pounds. And we've done about 10 million pounds in, a, in about five weeks. So it just illustrates the power and the efficiency of the ATM uh, uh, mechanism. John, BHP has a very large copper mine in Australia called Olympic Dam, and uranium is a byproduct. And I've read that they tend to sell that uranium into the spot market. So just a hypothetical, if they were to come in and sell a large uh, chunk of uranium and they, it drove the price down in the spot market, and let's just say drastically, how would you handle redemptions? Assuming, of course, you, you did get some redemptions because of that price move. Sure. Well, right now the trust does not have a redemption feature built in built in into it, uh, and obviously the complexities of trying to deliver physical uranium are, are 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 very different than delivering bars of gold or silver with our other trusts. So right now there is no physical redemption uh, mechanism or cash redemption mechanism, and and that's important to understand because I think one of the things that's overhanging the uranium market is this fear that there will be this big secondary supply of material like there was after Fukushima that will somehow undermine the market or, or basically uh, push the price down. And as I said earlier, the, the mandate of the fund is to operate in perpetuity and it's a passive holding company. That means we basically raise capital, buy material and stockpile it. Um, it's not designed to trade material, it's not designed to lease material or loan material to anybody. It's, a, it's really a passive vehicle that's designed to operate in perpetuity. 
And now I'm curious, I want to find out a little bit more about the market itself. Who are the actual sellers of uranium? Who is it you phone on a regular basis to find the supply? Sure. Well, we have a technical advisor called WMC Energy, and there's two individuals there that are both based out of the U.S. Um, they're both ex-chemical employees, and they've been a wonderful resource for the trust. And they basically assist us with all things physical uranium. So everything from procuring uranium to the contracts around those purchases to the end storage. And um, they've cast a very wide net in the marketplace. I mean, given the size of the trust and, uh, and the buying demand that, that we may be encountering from week to week, we want to make sure we have the best offers in front of us. So I think we've done uh, trades with 15 different counterparties so far, which I think is a great sign that a lot of people are interested in doing business with the trust. Um, and so we're looking for the best offers, whether it's coming from a trader, a producer, a utility, uh, an investment fund. Um, we've even bought a little bit of material from a junior uh, uranium miner. So we're basically scouring the world and, and trying to find the best pounds available with the shortest delivery windows possible. And so you raise a good point there about the, the delivery. When I buy a mm -hmm. stock in the market, it's settlement is T plus two. What's the settlement day for uranium? Yeah, that, that took a little while to get my head wrapped around uh, the, the nuances of the uranium market. So typically in the, in when you're buying physical, um, near-term deliveries is, is generally around 30 days. So within 30 days, there's a process to for the seller to notify the storage facility that they're going, they've sold the material and they need to change ownership title from, from them to us. Uh, that takes about 10 days, but the whole process can take about 30 days just to move the ownership title within, within uh, an existing warehouse arrangement. If you're talking about buying out in term, that could be two, three, four months. Generally, those pounds of material are, are usually in transit to a facility. So sometimes you have to wait two or three or four months to actually uh, take title of that material and um, settle up with cash. So right now, this product only trades in Toronto, but you are seeking a U.S. listing. What's the timeline associated with that? Yeah, the Toronto uh, listing has worked out very well. It's attracted a, a lot of uh, different investors from uh, around the world. One of the things we did with the reorganization of the trust is, is to also offer in U.S. dollars along with Canadian dollars. So that appeals to a, a broader set of investors. The end goal is obviously to dual list the trust like all of our other funds on the New York uh, Stock Exchange. And we're starting that work right now to, to prep our, our primary listing um, application. And one of the things I'm often asked is, well, how long is that going to take? And my answer is simply, I don't know. Because until you get into the actual uh, process with the SEC and start to receive comment letters, you really don't know how they're going to react, what are the questions they're going to focus on. Um, it will be considered a novel listing. Uh, and that's simply for the fact that no one has ever taken a uranium, physical uranium fund through the SEC process from start to finish. So we're going to be the test case. And whenever you're the test case, uh, there's always a bit of a wild card element to the process. And John, you mentioned earlier that the AUM is currently around 1.4 billion. Do you expect that to grow significantly when you do get that U.S. listing? I think it'll. I think it'll clearly help. I think it will open the fund to a, a greater audience. Uh, but I would say that the TSX listing and what it's done and the ATM in Canada has been very, very effective in terms of attracting new investors. So we're really happy with the TSX. I know we always think of it as the you know, in the shadow of New York, but I think it's doing a really great job. And what about the ATM? Will that change in any way when you get the U.S. listing? Um, we run ATMs on our, our dual listed funds on both sides of the border. And um, thankfully, about a year ago, the, um, the regulator here uh, relaxed the rules around ATMs to make them much more competitive with their U.S. counterparts. So we don't see any structural differences between running an ATM on the TSX and one and running running one on, on the New York Exchange. John, spot uranium started the year at thirty dollars, has gotten high as fifty bucks, so now it's somewhere around forty five, give or take. Do you think the utilities are paying attention to what's happening in the spot, or do they only care about the term market? Um, I think the utilities are definitely watching very closely. 
And the reason I'm saying that is because they're calling us, some of them. Um, and I would say it's not, they're not calling because they're alarmed. They're calling to basically get facts. They want to better understand how the trust works. How does the ATM work? How does the capital raising work? Um, because I think they're all trying to understand how the landscape is moving. And, you know, one of the things about uranium, as I said, it was in a horrible multi-year bear market where the price was either falling or going sideways for many years. And the reality was there was no urgency for a lot of utilities to, to reload contracts. The price was kind of going sideways or, you know, they were already locked in a previous supply agreement. So um, I think they're paying attention. The spot market is obviously not the term market where they, where they play. But as we know, when you look at the, at the yield curve, um, short-term short -term curve does affect the long-term end of the curve as well. So they are, they are watching, they are trying to figure out how that may impact and, and, and how they may have to adjust some of their, their, their strategies going forward. So I was speaking with somebody earlier today and they told me that they, they're hearing there's four different RFPs out there from utilities. Are you hearing the same sort of thing? Um, I've heard there's a couple of bellwether ones out there right now, one in the U.S. and one in Asia. That is going to be the first test and the first signal around uh, where do those contracts get uh, completed, what kind of prices, and everyone is, is waiting to see those. I think it'll be an important uh, event, but I don't think it's people should read too much into it because this contracting cycle um, moves slowly and it has a lot of runway to go. We think the next couple of years is really what is going to drive the longer term price as, as utilities uh, enter a new contracting cycle. So one of the things that can kill a bull market is, is supply. And we saw that back in 2007 when uranium got up to 137 bucks. We saw a lot of supply come into the market. And then, of course, it just killed demand. At what price do you think we're going to start seeing more supply? At what price do you think these producers who are currently offline start producing mm -hmm. again yeah i don't i don't know what that price is but i think um if you listen to cameco and, and kazaprom um you know they've been incredibly disciplined the last few years um and you know they, you know they were forced to obviously the market imposed uh, a very difficult situation on them where they had to had to close down and cut back production and i think you know they're watching they're watching what's happening obviously in the spot market that these contracts in the term market are going to give them some signals, but um, I think they need to see this uranium price really kind of firm and stay firm for a period of time before they're really going to change tack and and uh, and, and start to in, increase production out in time. Uh, you know, I just don't think they're going to have a knee-jerk reaction. The cost and time to bring these mines back uh, in into production is not short. Um, so if you're going to make a decision, you, you better be very confident about it. Other, you're, otherwise, you're going to have another false start. Well, that's a great overview of the uranium market, John. I want to ask you one more question before mm -hmm. I let you go. Uranium's up 40 plus percent on the year. Gold's down 10 percent. Silver's down 20 mm percent. -hmm. Is gold ever going to catch a bit again? Uh, yes, we, de we definitely think gold is going to catch a bit again. I think... Uh, we're very frustrated by the price of gold and silver. Um, I think right now gold is in a kind of a dormant state. It's not dead, but it's dormant. Uh, and I think a function, the function of that is really everybody is in kind of a risk on mode right now. You know, in 2020, gold was a star. Uh, it really did its job in terms of providing portfolio insurance and, and helped to mitigate against a lot of risks um, in the market when COVID uh, exploded. And, um, you know, fast forward to the last, you know, if you go back the last 12 months, um, people's attitudes about uh, the recovery and uh, the valuation of financial assets has changed dramatically. And so in, a, in this very cheap money accommodative uh, monetary and fiscal policy environment, uh, investors are being incented, incented to take risk. And, and gold is not a risk asset. It's a risk off asset, as we know. Silver, I think, is more is more uh, perplexing to us in terms of the fact that it is a hybrid metal, it is a, a monetary and a, an industrial metal, and and we're we're totally blown away that it is not uh, much stronger than it, than it is right now. 
Well, thank you for those insights on both uranium and also gold, John. And to all of our viewers, if any of you have any further questions for John or the Sprott team, please send us an email to info at wallstreetcapital.com and we'll get you an answer. Once again, John, thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Hi, Askar, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, James. Thank you for inviting. That's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Askar, I want to provide you with the framework on where I want to take this discussion, and I really want to touch on four elements. The first one being Kazataprom and just an overview of the company. And then I want to touch on the spot market, followed by the term market. And then I want to end our conversation with the discussion on the supply and demand and where the long-term price of uranium is going. So why don't we just start with an overview of the company, even though Kazataprom is the world's largest uranium producer, uh, producing approximately 23% of world production, a lot of people aren't familiar with the company. So why don't we just start with a brief overview? Well, sounds good. <clears throat> you know, um, Kazataprom is the national operator for atomic products in Kazakhstan. It was founded in 1997, and at, at that time, um, not Kazatomprom, but even Kazakhstan was not kind of a, a very big player in the uranium space, producing less than 1,000 tons just 20 years ago. Um, and now, um, essentially, we're being a largest producer in the world with over 20, slightly more than 24 and 6,000 tons produced in 2016, which was our record. So, <clears throat> a lot of growth that um, I mentioned happened during this so called uranium renaissance time, and um, that was also the time for um, most of the markets picking up, so there was um, big interest for the global commodity markets. Uranium was a part of that movement. So um, uh, what Kazdamprom was producing that time uh, has been soaked up by, by the market and uh, kind of the timing for increasing production was very, very good at that time. So. Um, um, we should mention that Kazdamprom uh, or Kazakhstan ended by producing uh, about 40% of the global primary production and Kazdamprom's share is 23%, just attributable share. So Kazakhstan and Kazaramprom have um, actually come a long way and Kazadamprom is now the largest uh, uranium producer since 2012. Um, the reason why we're the biggest uranium producers is our unique um, <clears throat> mines and reserves that we have. Um, all of them are ISR method. Um, so uh, we should mention that we're sitting on 300,000 uh, tons of attributable reserves uh, and keeping in mind that uh, we can produce 13,000 tons per year. That's a decade of uh, production. And even if we look more um, widely, we, we also have a, uh, resources, which is closer than 500,000 tons. And converting resources into reserves is very straightforward. Uh, all the deposits are large, they are homogeneous, uh, and kind of their unique feature, as I mentioned, is the ISR method. So all ISR method applies to all of these reserves and resources. So uh, we don't use any uh, open pit, any underground mining. Um, kind of what we do is very similar to oil production. We have the wells where we just pump the low pH uh, sul sulfuric acid solution. Um, it goes underground for an average of 600 meters and travels uh, through a sandstone hosted with uranium deposit uh, and stays there over for the period for three to four months, and then we just pump it out. So, kind of, that's the uh, 
ecologically very friendly method uh, with a closed cycle. So the uh, liquid that we are pumping out and removing uranium, then actually this liquid uh, goes back to the well field. So that's a very closed cycle. We don't generate any wastes. And at your peak, you said you produced 24,000 tons of uranium? Yes, indeed. How would that compare to the second largest producer in the world? Well, um, I think at that time, the second largest producers, producer were Cameco. They had two mines uh, and Inca's share that they had. So they were almost twice less than ourselves. Right. So you, you're just not, uh, if I was to use an oil analogy, because Zataprom is just not Saudi Arabia. It's really the OPEC of the uranium market. Yeah, yeah sort of. And as chief commercial officer, what exactly does your job entail? Um, well, yeah. <clears throat> so the chief commercial officer in our company, um, the role of the chief commercial officer in, in Kazaramprom is um, kind of making the strategy in terms of marketing and sales. But also in that position, I oversee the um, kind of all the activities around logistics, around deliveries, around uh, the contract execution, and also um, I oversee the activity of our trading company in Switzerland. Askar, Kazataprom went public in 2018, and shortly thereafter, the board of directors and the management team adopted a value strategy, which is essentially becoming more prudent in terms of your production and also in your marketing. But can you just touch on that and expand and tell us what policies you implemented? Yeah, thank you. Very, very good question. We um, indeed we uh, adopted a new strategy in 2018, and it is valid through 2028. So the main parts of the strategy is that we are focusing on uranium mining as our core business. We are optimizing production and sales volumes based on the market conditions, which was not the case before. Uh, of the IPO era. So um, also we're creating a value by enhancing, as you said, marketing and sales capabilities. We're implementing the best practices um, uh, from all over the world. And uh, we're developing our corporate, corporate culture um, that sustainable industry leaders should have. We implied this um, kind of, uh, strategy of responsible producer um, and we decided to produce as much as the market needs, actually. So we're not kind of following what we are producing and trying to sell it, but now we're kind of setting the targets based on the market conditions, and then we set up our production guidances. So you had seen our, um, uh, our publications that we've made in 2018 when we Kind of decreased our production to minus 20% from our subsoil uh, contracts level. We didn't see much improvement, so we extended that strategy for 2021, 22, and just recently we announced that we will be following the same strategy in 2023. So, um, kind of for us to consider returning back to 100% levels or even going over that uh, volume. Um, should be kind of, we should see certain market signals to do so. So you've become a lot more disciplined in your approach. Absolutely. We become much more disciplined. We, we were not producing um, as we used to produce. I mean, uh, in 2016, the volume was 24 and a half, slightly more. Then we, we kind of, stayed much lower of that volume, even though some of the um, subsoil use contracts even had an increase over the period. I mean, so we've never gone to that high uh, production volumes, but kind of hopefully we will be sometimes there and kind of market will need that pounds that, that are still in the ground. Askar, that's a great overview of Kazataprom, and now I, I want to get your views on the spot market and the recent price volatility. 
The spot price has moved significantly here in the last few weeks. It's gone from 30 to as high as $50 a pound. How do you think utilities are reacting to this price movement, if at all? Do they pay attention to the spot market? Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> they are um, they are closely watching what's happening on the market. We just recently had a fuel cycle members forum of WNA just a couple of days ago. Um, and we had a panel discussion there. And on that panel discussion, one of we, we had the news as one of the utilities. They they said that well, you know, we are watching closely. We are not uh, doing quick steps. Um, they are they are analyzing. But I mean, everyone who participated agreed that we will not be seeing the market as it was last year. I mean. Um, Active participation of financial players like Spot, uh, like Sprout, and like uh, Yellowcake, I mean, changed market significantly. Um, even though we might see some correction of price in the future, but it will most probably not return to to the levels that we had seen um, in, in this summer. Additionally to this, I would say it's not only um, it's not only the active position of uh, yellow cake and sprout but generally i mean um, the industry is moving towards nuclear uh, bigger exposure to nuclear uh, we are seeing those um, initiatives be included into the green policy parts uh, decarbonization is uh, also a big part we are waiting for europe to accept uh, nuclear as a clean energy source um, Kind of to help to reach their targets that they've um, committed under the Paris Agreement. So all these expectations, all these movements um, um, played a combined role together with uh, big interest from financial players, which we haven't seen before as well. So these are all good mix and combination of uh, of the things that happened on the spot market and kind of led to that price discovery that we had seen. So even though the spot market can be very active, it's estimated that only 25% of the trades on the spot market are real in, in the sense that they're going to real buyers, the utilities, and the rest is just pounds being exchanged between traders. Do you think these new market participants like Sprott and also Yellow Cake will make the spot market more efficient? Absolutely. I mean, we are already seeing how they are impacting the spot market. I mean, they are taking the material from the near-term and mid-term market and just putting to their kind of account at the conversion facilities. So those pounds currently are not returned back to the market and not being resold to other market participants. So, I mean, the, uh, the carry traders are having tough times at the moment because there is less and less material available on the market and we, what is available is being Kind of um, taken by uh, financials or producers, as we we could see. I mean, we were on the market, Cameco constantly on the market. We had seen even junior producers coming to the markets and buying um, the available volumes to hold them, which is I mean very good. But to to your previous question, I would also add. I mean, we had seen the utilities returning back to the market earlier this year. Uh, usually they have a good holiday period by September, and usually we we'll, we see them more active after WNA event, which happens in the uh, kind of first uh, week of September. But this year we've kind of um, seen them returning to the market slightly earlier. They were active from mid of August. We had seen several RFPs. Some of the utilities were very lucky to catch the pounds before Sprout came to the market. Others are evaluating what uh, offers they have on, on on their hands and i mean now the rfps and tenders are not just um, near term and mid term period but they are covering a uh, bigger period starting from 2024 5 and onwards and going up to 2030 which was not the case before and the kind of number of those requests and uh, RFPs are much, much higher than we had seen even in the past decade. 
So you raised some very good points here, and I just want to touch on a few of them. So the RFPs that are present in the market right now, they're, they're longer term. And so if I understand you correctly, in the last few years, they've been short term in nature, three to five years, but now they're looking five to 10 years out. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> so utilities for the last decade, I would say they were, um, they were in the market which was oversupplied. And in the end of the year, they were always coming to the market and they could always find any pounds they needed. So there was an excess of material and they could even declare the pricing that they wanted to see in order to get those pounds. So kind of, it was um, oversupplied market, which has started its movement when producers announced the production discipline. Some of the mines had to go offline because of the financial conditions and they couldn't sustain the production at that market price levels that we have seen in the end of 2016. So uh, with the market starting to move into the kind of, um, responsible production part, uh, we had seen a lot of the material being kind of removed and stayed in the ground for the future period. So now market is for the second consecutive year will be in the deficit because of the COVID impact mostly. But still, I mean, the years which were expected to be more balanced years will be deficit years. And those pounds uh, would not be uh, kind of caught, catched up by Cameco or by ourselves in the future. So they are kind of lost pounds and they will not be returning to the market. And I mean, more we look for the forecasts of our industry experts, we're seeing that um, the structural deficit will start uh, arising in after 2026, and then it will be just increasing. And by 2030, we would be seeing a very big deficit, which um, which would be even greater than another Kazakhstan prom. So many small producers sell uranium into the spot market. You touched on that earlier. Does Kazataprom sell into the spot market? Um, good question, James. <laughs> um, just recently, we've made an announcement that um, we completed our sales plan for 2021, and we will not be selling anything to the spot market. Um, but even before, we were very disciplined in, in terms of spot sales. After we um, adopted our strategy, we were more focused to work only with utilities. So we have some, uh, some contracts and activity when we are working with financial institutes, but usually we do so if we see that our strategy matches with them and kind of our long-term view matches with their long-term strategy. So, uh, but generally we are more focused on utilities, our priorities with them. And um, that's why we are not kind of selling our pounds at the spot market. We have our trading company, THK. Um, they are very active on the spot market, but the volume they trade there is very insignificant, very small. So they are uh, acting as a normal trader. They are getting um, market intelligence. They are exchanging volumes. So kind of, sustaining the liquidity of the spot market. So once again, you touched on this a couple of times, but once again, it's all about being disciplined and you want to sell your product to real buyers, utilities who have a real use for it and not to short-term traders who just want to flip it for a quick profit and in the process distort the market. Absolutely. I mean, that's our strategy. We're not uh, doing business at the moment with uh, traders, we are not reselling to intermediaries, so we are just focusing on um, long-term market with uh, our utilities. So that's a good overview of the spot market, and you touched a little bit on the term market, but I, I want to just expand on on the the term market. And can you just speak to the contracts that are out there? And, and, and I want to get a better sense of how that market works or with the utilities, because a lot of these contracts that were set five or 10 years ago, they're going to start rolling off in 2023. So 
you as the world's largest producer, how do you react to that or how do you change your production plan? So the long-term contracting uh, actually started when there was this um, uh, uranium re renaissance, when there was a big uh, shortage of supply on the market. Um, so in 2008-10, still Fukushima has happened. Actually, there was a long-term contracting and the contract period was 10 to 15 years. So that was um, kind of uh, normal for the market at that time. But when Fukushima happened, actually market started to revert and we had seen less and less long-term contracting. And instead we had seen more spot contracting and near-term contracting. <clears throat> so um, as now the market is going to revert back again, uh, we're more expecting utilities to start um, discussions over securities of supply because, I mean, they cannot afford themselves to, um, to be in a position when they don't have a uranium, which is the main product for their um, reactors that they have to run. So that shift is happening now. We're seeing the uh, requests and tenders being issued for a much longer time periods than it was before. Before they were coming and requesting a certain volume in a certain year, or just a kind of very small volumes like 300,000, 200,000 pounds per year for a three year period. Now the periods are becoming longer and quantities are becoming bigger. So that's what we're seeing. I mean, all of this is being pushed by uh, overall demand. I mean, with ins and outs in um, nuclear power plants all over the world, I mean, the general trend is increasing uh, by one and a half percent. And as WNA predicts, I mean, in 2040, we will have twice more um, electricity generated by nuclear than it is in 2020. And when you say the contracts or the pounds that are demanded are growing or becoming bigger, uh, how how much bigger? Like, are they asking for, is it going from 100,000 pounds to a million pounds or how much are they looking for or asking for? Well, yeah, I mean, depends on the utility, um, uh, which is uh, coming, but I mean, even the small utilities, they've increased their uh, volumes almost twice. Um, and just uh, I'll try to give an example, which is which is uh, public. I would say um, China just recently announced their five-year plan um, for um, building nuclear power plants and uh, uh, electricity that they will be generating from nuclear. So the plan is very ambitious. Um, they are going to generate 70 gigawatts from uh nuclear from 40 that they're ge generating now so they will be building much more nuclear power plants and just after they've made that, that announcement uh, in june um cnnc has had has announced that they will be building a big uh warehouse on the uh border of kazakhstan and china which has to um which has to store 23,000 tons by 2026. So that's an estimate. And I mean, that's a very significant quantity that most probably will be used as a strategic inventory that um, China would be using to make sure that they will have necessary pounds to support their nuclear program. So that's one of the examples that we can kind of share. And I mean, that's not only China who is being worried about future security of supply. So uh, other utilities are also there, but they would like to see that um, the current kind of price movement and price increase, it's not a temporary move, but it should be some something that will be for uh, long term. And once again, I just want to reinforce that all these changes that are coming and especially with the long-term contracting and the way it works within this industry, this is one of the reasons why you've curtailed production because you know these contracts are coming up for renewal and these utilities are gonna begin looking for a lot of 
pounds. And uh, so you want to make sure you're ready for that. And at the same time, you want to make sure you get a, a good price. You'd rather sell uranium at 43 or $53 a pound as opposed to 33. Well, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we would like to, to have the value for the pounds that we're selling. And if we are to increase our production and if we are to, uh, to start any new greenfield mines that we have, I mean, we should uh, we should convince our board to spend those um, to spend those money into the investing, and we should see some incentive price, which we are not indicating as we are the lowest cost producer. But I mean, such um, such uh, decision that we would be making in terms of increasing our production should be supported by the long term contracting that we have to that we have to see from from the utilities. So without this long-term contracting, I mean, it would be hard to convince our board or to make decision to uh, to increase the production. And, and you brought up China and their demands. And I also want to uh, just touch on France, given that 70% of their electricity comes from nuclear reactors. And it's estimated that they use 25 million pounds of uranium annually. So given their demands, they just can't phone you up today and say, hey, I need some uranium next year. They have to think five or 10 years out to make sure they have the supply. Absolutely. I mean, EDF remains our strategic partner, our strategic customer. We have um, ongoing contracts with them. Unfortunately, I cannot disclose the volume of the contracts and the period of the contract. But I mean, you are completely right. I mean, EDF is 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 the company that has a good strategy in terms of making sure that they have um, security of supply. So that's a great discussion on the term market and also the spot market as car. Now I want to move on and, and tie it all together. And I want to look at the supply and demand side and the fundamentals and try to get an idea of where the long-term price is going. And you mentioned this before, we have this whole green economy and decarbonization and according to the World Nuclear Association, there's 443 reactors that are active in the world right now. There's 57 that are currently being built. There's over 100 that uh, are planned on being built. So there's a lot of demand coming from the reactors. And then with the whole green economy and the push toward net zero emissions, the demand side looks very robust. But then when you look at the supply side, as you mentioned, the supply you and other producers have really cut back and it's estimated that between 2021 and 2030 there's going to be uncovered demand for 700 million pounds so having said all that do you think it's different this time as you mentioned the demand side is very robust it's increasing we will have more and more reactors being built um, especially in, in asian countries in china in india um, we hope that they will be followed by Eastern Europe, maybe some part on, on the Middle East, as we had seen in newcomers to our industry like United Arab Emirates. So um, we should also expect maybe SMRs to come to the market as well. That, that will be an additional, even uh, more bigger demand. I mean, SMRs have a big, big and great potential to kind of to reshape the whole industry. but. Yeah, you're right. At the moment, we don't have any um, replacement for uranium as a fuel, and it has to be produced in order to make sure that all this um, industry will have enough material. I mean, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning of, of this interview, we have a great uh, resources and reserves. And again, we would like to make sure that uh, we have um, we have um, um, incentivized value to invest into these um, deposits that we have, and I mean these discussions I think are, are starting now. They are not very uh, quickly starting, but we're seeing utilities starting to discuss some uh, longer term volumes um as we were indicating we are not um 
we're not setting a certain price like other utilities or like other producers are doing for us much more important is um, having a contract portfolio that will be um, letting us to increase our production um, in terms of price um, that should incentivize producers to bring new mines i think we should refer to the idle capacities that we have on the market now and um, and the most obvious one is Makarto River by Kameko that has to come online next because that's the uh, top plus mine with all the capexes in. They just have to restart it back. The price should be followed by the contract. Um, so if we would be seeing that um, intention from utilities to start discussing with the big sustainable primary producers um, to bring uh, idle capacities uh, for coming to its MacArthur for ourselves it's returning back to 100% or even going more for 120% um, but in terms of greenfield projects I mean there should be something more more than Kamiko's restart for MacArthur price to incentivize and um, as, as we discussed I mean the volume is too big to be covered only by Kazaran Prom. That should be uh, kind of several primary sustainable producers that should be incentivized by the industry to, to bring those pounds to cover this huge gap that we are foreseeing. So once again, it's estimated that between 2021 and 2030, there's uncovered demand for 700 million pounds, which is a lot. And you also mentioned earlier that you the market essentially needs another Kazataprom. And is there another Kazataprom out there somewhere? <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to discuss the um, mines outside of Kazakhstan for ourselves. I mean, we are not very sure if they are um, sustainable mines. I mean, we know that they have a big reserves, but we are not sure about their capexes. Their estimated production costs might be very attractive, but I mean, only he, time will show if that's the case or not. So, for any future production outside Kazakhstan, I wouldn't kind of comment on that. But in terms of Kazakhstan, we have enough production to 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 make sure that the uh, that we will do um, everything we can to to support the industry. But I mean, as we said. There should be some other primary producers incentivized to bring their mines as well. It cannot be just Kazakhstan Prom um, trying to bring the pounds to the market. So you tell a very bullish story for uh, uranium price and where the long-term price is going. So I want to put you on the spot now, Askar, and ask you where you think the price of uranium will be in five years. Well, you know. <laughs> That's a very, very interesting question. I mean, if you would ask me one month ago whether the price would be 50, um, I don't think I would say that it will be 50 just one month ago. But we're now at 50 with 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 all this kind of um, activity on the market and kind of Sprout doing a tremendous job. I mean, they've actually shown to the whole market what's the real depth of the market and that the spot market should never be considered as a reliable source of a long-term supply so with a kind of price being formed at at the spot activity which you also mentioned is only 30 percent going to the real utilities and other material is going back and forth i mean it's very hard to predict where it would be because that price is not a fundamental price uh, or let's say is not the price set by kind of fundamental moves. So we might more look to this long-term price, but where it will be, I think it it has to be somewhere where the new incentivizing price for the mines should be. Askar, typically when I wrap up my conversations, I always ask the company what investors can expect in terms of news flow in the coming weeks and months. But given the size of your company and also your long-term outlook, I'm going to have to ask you what investors can expect in the coming years from Kazataprom. Well, 
I think investors should expect that we'll still keep our um, strategy. Um, we will still be uh, valuing all the market conditions before making any decision about production. But at the same time, we don't want to have uh, shocks all on, on the market. We don't want to repeat the story that we had seen in 2007 and 8, when we had this huge um, increase of the price with a um, quick fall. So we would like to have the market be in a sustainable kind of condition without huge peaks and shocks. So we are, um, as we indicated uh, at pre-IPO, we have some uh, we have some deposits that we are developing. So we are kind of starting to prepare some of the assets that we might need in the future um, because some of our mines are also running out and we'll have um, several mines that will kind of go offline by the end of this decade. So we need to replace them and we need to make sure that whenever market gives us certain signals and we understand that utilities need more pounds we should be on time so uh, we are doing some some of the exploration on on the um, of deposits that we had indicated in our ipo um ipo documents so generally i mean as i said we will be keeping our market discipline we will keep our mar market centric strategy and uh, we will be focusing uh, on the long-term market with utilities. That's that's what the investors should know. Askar, that's a great overview of Kazataprom, and also I enjoyed hearing your reviews on the spot market and the long-term market and also the supply and demand dynamics. And I want to thank you for making the time today, and you've been very gracious. Thank you. Thank you, James. Well, that brings us to the end of our Uranium Conference, and I hope you found it informative. If you have any further questions for any of the presenters, or if you would like some research on any of the presenting companies, send us an email to info at bloorstreetcapital.com, and we'll send it along. Once again, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Bloor Street Capital, and also hit that notification button. Thank you for your support.